Dr. Radha Krishnan, Principal Secretary to Government of Tamil Nadu, and Co-Chair Dr. Runa H. Bogle, Assistant Director for Science and Programs, DZHP CDC India. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome, sir, for this. I, I will hand over the stage to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Hari ji, uh, for the post lunch session. Uh, we know uh, most of us after lunch are uh, mostly feeling tired or sleepy or snappy. But anyway, this program is very important and we have to continue with it. And we are lagging over time. So without uh, uh, putting any briefs, uh, I would welcome my co-chairs and also one of the co-chairs is a presenter also. And uh, he has some other engagements too. So without wasting time, I will introduce uh, Dr. J. Radha Krishnanji. Uh, he is a senior bureaucrat from Tamil Nadu who has dealt with uh, the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami way back in 2004 and uh, during the recent times the COVID-19 as uh, Secretary Health as well as Secretary Disaster Management. Uh, I would request him to kindly share his experiences with all of us. Sir, we will have uh, 10 minutes uh, if possible and, uh, because of shortage of time we have to restrict our time on time. Good afternoon to everybody. Most respected uh, Ajit Sev sir, uh, who has been uh, for us at all when we joined service with Dr. Kundre, I am a 92 batch officer. That is the time of the challenges which he has faced and all. I uh, feel deemed a privilege to get an opportunity to share this and respected uh, uh, chairs and co-chairs. And quickly, uh, you can put on the slide show. It is here. Okay. So this, uh, quite a lot of slides, I'll take it as read and I'll go to the real issue. So uh, the nature of presentation, no, I'll take it as read. See the background, uh, whether it is Tamil Nadu, India, world, we have been successfully combating several disasters and all. For example, in Tamil Nadu, if I look at you know, preventing epidemics after Chennai floods, why this is important? Gaja cyclone, every two years we will have cyclone earlier, Thane, Varda, strike. Then again, 2009, if you all remember uh, swine flu, that was called a pandemic. Dengue regularly now in more than 140 countries are there. Zika was first identified in a PLC in Tamil Nadu. Then neighboring state, Norwadipa, they handled it well. But it was all successfully watered. But that is the environment in which we are working. What happened was challenge of capacity. I had a chief secretary before. I, I was, uh, I got an opportunity to work six and a half years earlier as chief secretary. Then again, there was tsunami from disaster management. One chief secretary, when I am young, the chicken sir, he called me one day and said, Rather, we claim Tamil Nadu is number one in the, uh, one of the best states in health. So, sir, what a shame that you don't have an RTPSAR testing center for swine flu. We have had seven in uh, government and 14 in private. That is the background in which one of the better, claiming to be a better performing state, we have to handle. Then, genome sequencing was one of the challenges in containment, lockdown and all. Now, these, of course, uh, uh, I'll uh, take it as red. These are all uh, uh, the challenges which we all face in the initial lot. So, I'll directly come to the uh, uh, challenges which we have. One is infrastructure. We had uh, uh, one uh, King Institute where they could do this diagnosis and 10 beds in GH Madhur, uh, Chennai. That was the level in which we started. And uh, this is not new. Corona, earlier MERS was there, uh, the SARS was there. MERS did not touch up with 30% mortality. SARS was there in 2002. But we never thought this something happening in one market where animal uh, man interface is there, it will jump species. Even when it jumps species, we never thought it will be so bad. So that is the challenge. And when such challenges come, I find that, you know, earthquake is there, tsunami he mentioned, that when people are willing to work. Here, when we are saying, please come, 50% to leave and another 50% not willing, even if it's a walk-in interview, people are not willing to come. PP is not there, PP is there in one hospital, another hospital is not there. That is the kind of background in which we started, even though we are all very capable. Because the scale became very high. 
Then current situation in Tamil Nadu had a very good disaster. It had experience in man-made disaster. It has a rich history in public health. One of the few states where historically, if you look at oldest hospital, 1679 somebody says, but 1664 somebody says, but oldest hospital was in GH, present GH. Everything and uh, one Lieutenant Colonel King was the first sanitary commissioner who uh, established the issue of quarantine when plague came. And his name, King Institute Hospital, is there. <coughs> These are all histories. Public Health Act is there from 1939. Department is there from 1922. That is the kind of rich history we had. I'll quickly come to the. I think this is part. Ah, historical background. Even earlier, whether it was a cholera, plague, smallpox, so it is not going to be the last kind of thing. Now we had a good. Next. It is celebrating 100th year. State of this is, I cannot complain like other places. This is the kind of government hospitals in uh, uh, Tamil Nadu. That is the uh, facilities where the latest, you know, uh, we did 1.5 lakh scans. This is the kind of background in which we had skilled manpower we had, but the situation was different as it rapidly came. This I will take it as some record. But I, I'll just come to the second wave peak. If you look at it, it went up to oh, 3,30,000 active cases. Look at the total bed strength we have. We have almost uh, 70,000 inpatients we have, and we have daily 600,000 cases we handle. But suddenly, one disease is handling so many cases. So the impact it had, everybody is looking at it from COVID point of view, but so many deaths happened due to uh, people not going, the kidney transplant patient not going to, uh, 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 what say, the dialysis patient could not go. Similarly, the third, and ultimately now, after the third wave peak, things have calmed down. This is the background in which we are all meeting. We are hoping that last one year and all, Omicron is only going for sub variants. Uh, even now, some BS7 is there in China. But we feel that, you know, probably our vaccination was much better. We may not have. This is the kind of background in which we are then 64.5 crore cases, 66.4 lakh uh, deaths, 4.47 lakh cases, 5.3 lakh. And if I stand in front of you, 38,049 deaths in Tamil Nadu alone. That is not a small number. So that is where I think this particular conference is important. And uh, what we did, this is where we need to ruminate. What happens is everybody talks that we handled tsunami. I was sent on the day of tsunami. We have everything in implicit and tacit memory. That is why I would compliment NIDM. This time they did concurrent training. And they are documenting it. When in Chennai, when cases went about 200, the government said that you took, take care of Chennai. So when it was 200, and you imagine that the uh, 200 was a crisis point in May 1, 2020. But after that, we decided that we had to follow medical experts. Here, NCDC, I'm very grateful that you know you have brought in a National Center of Disease Control. That's a very critical component where, wherever infectious diseases come. So we have CDC Atlanta, World Renown thing. But somewhere down the line, we started handling it on a different mode. So that is where public health experts said you need to do fever camps, doorstep testing of COVID, fever camps in hotspot areas, single window system for that. These were all evolved during the time. Triage, field based people did, uh, sending back the COVID care center, COVID health center, COVID uh, uh, hospitals and exclusive COVID hospitals, then having oxygen beds, co uh, uh, symptomatic case management, accelerated COVID vaccination drive. These were all brought in, lockdown and mask enforcement. This we need to have, we have so many government, government of India gave us a lot of directions, we also issued. That we tend to forget before, after the next issue comes, we start running. So that is where I think this documentation will be very important. Best practices in Tamil Nadu, 24 by 7 controlled room, what we did was, particularly, we decentralized it because first it thought, they thought it is a Chennai based problem. Then it went to neighboring four districts. Then it went to southern district. Then it went to western district. Then it went to, and wherever it went, wherever the people were thinking it has not come, it came with a bigger force. That is where block level and uh, district level war room concept became very useful. Interdepartmental coordination was very important. Volunteers. I would personally feel that, you know, this rapid expansion of the facilities, one, production, whether it is PPE, whether it is ventilator, whether it is uh, RT-PCR centers. We, in Tamil Nadu, you see, I will be very happy to share that once Honorable Prime Minister mentioned that Tamil Nadu did not go for 
officially supporting that uh, anti uh, antigen test, the other test. You know, uh, we simply went for RT PCR testing. And uh, today we have a capacity of 4 lakh RT PCR tests a day, and uh, we were able to give. Then intersectoral coordination are there. I will just be a key challenges, sudden need to upgrade infrastructure and employ personnel, initial reluctance of the first wave private sector participation was nil. Second wave private sector finished all the loans they repaid. They came actively, that is where I think uh, Honorable Chief Secretary was mentioning about regulation, uh, Cabinet Secretary. So regulatory mechanisms had to cut in, every day was a learning. Oxygen, Tamil Nadu is an oxygen, we don't have enough steel plants, it's an oxygen deficit state. But suddenly, our demand from 2.30, it went to 6.30. So luckily, the national plan ensured that we were able to get oxygen from the deficit state, and you believe it or not, again, people will forget. From Singapore in ship, oxygen used to come to Vishakapatnam and send. From planes, the trucks used to be sent to uh, 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 Calcutta, and from there, they will be loaded, and of course, containers are there. And when you look at, there was a shortage of containers. Then Tamil Nadu bought, Almost 20 Government of India gave containers, but that is short. So if you have to run up and down, we have to buy our own containers. So 24 containers ultimately came from Siberia. But this all made decision makers to take quick decisions. So this was one thing. The final challenge for Tamil Nadu was vaccination. If you look at this uh, the vaccination, we are a vaccine hesitant rate. Oxygen capacity, I will just tell. Before the first wave, if you look at 24,006 concentrators and 270 oxygen generators could be installed, including under PM cards and under CSR, free of charge. But before that, May 2000, deadly May 2021, this was not there and India witnessed the challenge. So that is where I think self-sufficiency used to be uh, as an area where we need to work. Then key lessons, considering the recent spread of transboundary and zoonotic <coughs> diseases, COVID-19, swine flu, Zika, we need to con be constantly prepared for them. As the, despite the pandemic, the regular maternal child health services, emergency services also need to be done. Aggressive focus testing, this many places they will tell you have testing come through. Case bahut jada ho jayega, to log aapko gali denge. Luckily, our chief ministers got convinced in this time, they heard public health experts. Then they said, after a particular stage, Night testing, if a 500 means a 5,000 test is done or not. So 30, 20 to 30 contact tracing to be done. So the, the reverse quarantine, elderly people brought back and check, you know, the affected people. These measures, we sometimes tend to forget. See, vaccination, testing, gene sequencing, zero surveillance. Zero surveillance, now we are a state lab, but that again, we are only 12 lab. I'll just, decentralized mitigation measure is what we need to do. I will go back to the final slide because I have 10 minutes. Long-term strategies, everything, I'll leave it here. This is a PowerPoint, I'll leave it here uh, in a PowerPoint format. Uh, <coughs> come back to the final slide so that you know others can also speak. See, this is one slide where I wish to tell everybody to attend. One health, I myself have admired in a post-graduation genetics before I came to civil services. Neglect of one health is 2007, 8 or 9, United Nations talked about it. We, we forget it. Again, if you look at climate change, they are telling in Siberia, a frozen virus for 40,000 years is now coming out. So we need to tell people that now we need to be careful. We cannot be uh, living together with, uh, in thinking that I will live alone. If you look at live animals are being traded, jumping species. Till now, bird flu goes to a man, does not go from man to man. Suddenly it goes. Parovirus, it, animal parovirus is different, but suddenly it comes. So we need to be mentally prepared. Whether CDC Atlanta says or WHO says, we need to also look at one health scenarios. Non-health intervention is very important. Everybody forgets Government of India's very good interventions, PMGKV. Tamil Nadu has universal, uh, uh, you know, we give food to everybody, but this particular additional allocation, even for states where it was not free, made a very big impact. Then converging all programs, psychosocial care, involving local self-government and involving, and here volunteers had to be trained volunteers, not like other disasters. Having a coordinated approach is important. Health sector needs effective capacity building to prepare to handle all emergencies, whether natural or man-made or biological or other persons, need to retain capacity. This is one sad thing which I keep telling. I have been health secretary for the years. We run on contract. Tamil Nadu 70% is regular. 
But somewhere down the line, the person who tested every day your lab samples, he is told that, you know, COVID is over, you are going to go UN, at least I was working in UN for three years, registering search capacity. Should I not register search capacity? He was so capable, he handled it. When it was a war, he was willing to work. Then we will say, I return exams, so the fellow who is, or the nurses who are not willing to work will get employment. Those who suffered, should we not give it? So we are trying to give some additional marks to them so that we can retain them. And capable NGOs need to be done. These are some of the, uh, the things which I am just telling, you know, it, it had to be a multi pronged generator, a temporary hospital. This, uh, the, everybody knows that the last one, our uh, union health minister was there always. And this is one area I honestly want to tell. Government of India and state, everybody, you know, press they will ask. So of the coordination has been possible. It were well coordinated. It was not politics. Honestly, uh, uh, we worked together. It went off smoothly. Okay. Last night, we did that. Only one slide. Yeah. See, this is the kind of I am just showing you uh, in reality how we mobilize. In the last, last slide, we, 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 uh, Future scenarios, I think little bit I would have put up with from Madam CDC Atlanta, Madam's thing, I improved it. But basically I talk about emerging and re-emerging diseases. She also mentioned about new diseases that is going to keep us on our toes. Compounded already by drug resistant organism, except after polystyl, polymyxin, I don't think a new antibiotic has come. So that is one, a transboundary diseases due to increased international trade and travel, Madam, I picked up from you. I always talk of transboundary diseases, but the trade and travel, like she mentioned, 36 hours things come. Similarly, zoonotic and other diseases, jumping species will make the need to constantly keep up surveillance and work on strengthening system on preventive strategies, uh, uh, need, uh, important need. Need also to ensure that we don't look, uh, lose focus on other communities. TB, we have slided. TB. Similarly, we have slided on other communicable diseases. This time, if you look at USA, syncytial virus, which is routinely coming respiratory, that is going up. Flu is going up. So we cannot neglect them. Other non-communicable diseases, if you look at, if somebody had to go for dialysis three days a week, he gave it two days. If he had to do for three sessions, his session was cut. So, so many challenges were there. Capacity developed has to be included, which I mentioned. Not to forget contribution as there is a constant need for rapid interoperable and scalable. Again, you know, we, if Chennai was having a problem, other districts came. In pandemic, every district starts having a problem. These were challenges. Need to have this, uh, this again, I picked up the last line from Madam's uh, thing, because many a times our communication, uh, uh, we will put with Sardarji. Like cut and paste, we will put an advertise. That person doesn't understand. One nation, one card. So we need to locally uh, make it understandable. Then look at the pain of people. I remember in October, one I was seeing a TV, when the last lockdown we are about to live, one person said, Sir, in Tamil, he said, I will translate in, in Hindi, I will tell, Aap log sabhi essential, non-essential karke mera kaam log I am working as a laborer in OMB market. But for me, my job is essential, yet koi samastha bhi nahi hai. That is the answer. Then I went to Honorable CM and said, Sir, Omicron thoda kam hai, sir. I don't think we should be so tight. We need to understand that the balance from economy has to be there. But ultimately, the five-pronged strategy is what we need to remember. Not many people know swine plant may be one strategy. Tha. You know, for all disinfection and all. We forget. Tacit memory only survives. Implicit memory survives. You need to do the recording just like you did for Kumbhakona. We need to circulate. I appreciate, sir I spoke so well about his experience. Madam spoke so That distilled information we need to give to the collector and administration side, we need to learn as IAS officers that we also need to hear. We cannot, this is not like, you know, earthquake or thing where I can take a view what I feel is the best. I need to get the whatever we had, Somya Swaminathan and say. So it is a very important learning, but I feel that we still need to prepare ourselves for larger challenges because climate change is going to affect us. Uh, other diseases are going to, like uh, monkey pox has um, uh, again uh, come. Then we have monkey fever, as no, not many people will do. Uh, in Tamil, there is a co comedy scene when I think that everybody's name, na, adabari, in front of them, uh, 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 animal name they give. Monkey fever, monkey pox, swine fever, swine flu, uh, swine uh, flu, bird flu, uh, 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 bobo culture. So, <coughs> then tomato also they start. 
uh, hand for that one. So we need to not frighten people, but educate them that hygiene is a, uh, a message which we need to follow. Hand washing is important. Just like for deworming, we did that message. We need to do the messaging and in peace time, just like we do the drill. We need to do the drill. I was just discussing 270 uh, last message and I quit the place. 270 auction concert, uh, uh, you know, uh, generators we have kept. But many of them are at present under disuse. Should we not ensure that once a month they are put in place? We were struggling for one bit of oxygen. Even a health secretary could not assure oxygen. That was the level in which we were in May. Similarly, oxygen concentrators. Then ensuring redundancy in this. So I think, last but not least, this is not limited to COVID. Diarrhea comes after uh, this in Pakistan experience, they are telling recent front. So, this particular as a public health emergency and disaster management is something very intervened. Immediately, it is not found, but in a long term, our role becomes very important. I thank NIDM and also respected cabinet secretary and all the others from CDC Atlanta and other authors for having documented this and uh, you all kept it under 24. That web conference was very important. And I really respect the practitioners and the participants who actually are the faceless people. I always end by telling a lot of people tell who are the real. Every state now they will make somebody hero. But real hero is the person who is doing the, uh, there was somebody who can, can, keeps on disinfecting, somebody who is always taking the sample, whose face is not on whose name, the nurse who handled the first COVID case. Those are the heroes who are faceless, but behind the scenes, they had the courage to start. After that, only all of us went. That is an honest truth. Many doctors were hesitant. With these few words, I thank NIDM for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Maybe you can have one or two questions because he has to leave, sir. Different players with different capabilities. 
strength and capacity, the movement has strength and the institution has strength, including the private sector, all the private sector. And, uh, you know, that would make you prepare you to be more resilient when the next, whatever it is, comes, whether it's a tsunami or COVID-19. So, so systems building is more important. And I want to elaborate something which has already been said, whether that involves, uh, you know, capacity building, you know, provisioning of hospitals, machines, training, doctors, nurses, whatever. So I hope that uh, you know, this, this uh, event was will inspire people. Thank you, sir, for the uh, input, sir, after the presentation by Dr. Uh, so, now, I, I had actually the opportunity to work together with uh, Dr. Radhakrishna during COVID-19. I was part of IMCD in April 2020. And I've seen him how hard he had worked day and night, 24 by 7. Uh, so, that was the way they have actually achieved their target. So I must appreciate and congratulate him for his vision and the work both together. And now we have the opportunity to call the second uh, expert and resource person, Dr. Pardeep Hasnovesi, who is DDE, Disaster Management and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. He's a nodal officer on disaster management on behalf of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Please. Thank you, sir. I have a short presentation I will just run through because of the paucity of time. So the slides So basically I was told to speak about the UOC, but I will go outside UOCs also. So when we talk about the health emergencies, this was my topic, setting up of the health emergency operation centers. So can you go to the next slide? Sorry. So when we talk about the preparedness and response of the health emergencies, whether it is the international level, strengthen of the WHO capacity to address to the health crisis, prioritize and implementation of the WHO health emergency program that is going in big way. I had seen some of our WHO colleagues also joining over here. Unified operation capacity for the global health emergencies that becomes a very important part. Mapping of the resources, what Sir had just told us. Mapping of the resources and pre-emergency medical logistics and addressing the regulatory concern. That is during the peace time, that is the job that we need to do. Whether we will be sitting at any level, I speak about from the PHC to the highest level. Wherever we will be sitting, it is our moral responsibility to see that we are prepared. We are not caught unarmed, that yeah, you are not ready. Prioritize the research on drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, so that we know what is coming next. It should not happen that after a pandemic or after a disaster, we start searching for newer drugs, newer vaccines or something. That should be the part and parcel of our life. And addressing the funding requirements, because that becomes important. And for the health perspective, the country has to spend more than what is required now as per the GDP percentage. So when we talk about, I will try to skip this slide because this was told to a greater extent regarding the disasters and the outbreaks the country had already witnessed throughout for the last few years. And this is the composite disaster risk index of the states that was published through UNT Group. We can see all of our states are finding some place or other. And the most populous states like Maharashtra, Gujarat and West Bengal, that they come top up in the list. So we need to be really prepared for such kind of disasters from happening. So when we talked about all this thing, there is a need for there is a need for setting up of the health emergency operation centers at the MOHW and the states, which was tried to be built as per the WHO framework of public health emergency operation centers, we call it to the EOC name, to achieve the mandates of IHR 2005 to address two emergencies that have health consequences to the member states, to establish and improve their emergency operation centers, to strengthen the communication coordination for effective public health response. Now, when we talk about the health emergency operation centers, what should be the objectives of such kind of an health emergency operation centers? 
Number one is managing, coordinating, collaborating with the emergency responses through provision of information, communication, technology tools and services. Conducting information management and sharing functions such as information collection, integrating, coordinating, displaying, distributing and storing, providing situation reports and managing information flow. Enabling response related decision making operation liaison with the risk communication. Deployment, management, emergency personal staffing, logistics, and planning functions. But the problem lies that the scheme have provisions of HOC with a limited interoperability. Because many of the states they have come up with their own HOCs also. But when we talk about per se as a country, there is a limited SOPs for managing the health crisis, the lack of interoperability. What is a health crisis for a particular state may not be the same language as we speak for the other state. Plethora of health data across the centralized health IT systems. We have a lot of platforms stop collecting data, doing it in their own silos. There is need to break those barriers, whether it is through the IHIT system or whether it is through the HMI system, e-hospital, telemedicine. There is a required for a conversion to the meaningful health system information. Access of comprehensive view for the potential public health preparedness. Then access of a common platform for monitoring the preparedness. Absence of a single source for the true health of the data sets. Absence of a common health standards and the health indices. Every state will come up that this is what we have. So this is the time we should just rise upon and let us have a common platform. So under our disaster management cell, we are running some of the programs. We call it to be the health sector disaster preparedness and response. Health risk for uh, development for emergency services. And we also are implementing the PMRV. So when we talk about the health sector disaster preparedness and response, the basic objective is to strengthen the capacity for the health sector to prevent, mitigate and remain prepared to respond to the adverse outcomes of disaster. Under this, we are carrying on a number of trainings to the states and the districts, like training of the district health officers for managing public health emergencies, training of hospital managers on hospital preparedness and emergencies, training on psychosocial care in disaster setting, training of the disaster management or radiological emergencies, and training of doctors and hospital engineers on hospital safety. There are some infrastructure projects which are also getting implemented. I like to compliment Radha Mitchell, sir. Stanley Medical College is one of those centers where the tertiary CDRM facility is coming up and it will be commissioned very shortly. Another one is coming up in Bhopal in the northern part of India. Rest, we have the secondary level CDRM centers that is coming in different parts of the country. Other activities like preparation and finalization of the risk communication plan and IC material with the health aspects of disaster. This is one of the central sector schemes that is getting implemented. When we talk about the human resource development for the emergency services, the basic objective being to strengthen the human resource capacities for providing the emergency medical services through capacity building. We have a national emergency life support scheme. This is generally specifically for the doctors, nurses and paramedics. So we are having already around 100, more than around 100 health centers in different medical colleges or medical schools in the country. Somebody in the morning was just asking us, why don't we involve the medical colleges, sir? We have already included them into the health centers. They are, and we are also making them uh, doing the TOTs, the training of the trainers. And they in turn are expected to carry out this training down below at the district and sub-district levels. At the central and state medical colleges and autonomous medical institution. Wherein we have A to Z of disasters, it is not only just for cardiac emergencies and all, but it is for all kinds of disasters and the medical response, emergency response. So let me just come back to again to HEOC which we are just talking about. So under the PM Aveem scheme, we have the mandate of establishing the health emergency operation centers and for the development of a container-based mobile hospitals for deployment of the emergency medical teams which in WHO is also helping us to do on this in a big way. So I'll skip the slide. So already we have developed an operational guidelines for the state, which is, will be shared with most of the states, which is just signing an MOU, wherein the HOCs will be developed. This operational guidelines include the broad specification of the physical infrastructure, information of the communication technology, the IRS organization of the HOCs, along with the mode of operation of HOCs and performance benchmark of the HOCs. So basically, what is the mandate of this HOC when we talk about? We are proposing a hybrid model by utilizing the already approved schemes and funds, managing the health emergencies during pandemic, and working as a health observatory during the novel times. And we have two scenarios. Suppose a pandemic strikes, what this HOC would be doing? 
each existing approved NGOs will be acting as the respective state, with the hub and spoke model, which will be implemented when the state NGOs will be integrated with the national NGOs, which may be located in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. The connected NGOs network will provide a comprehensive view of the pandemic response, what Sir had already guided us that we need to work in the peacetime of the real time information flow. A normal functioning of the health observatory during a peace time would be like multiple IT platforms for managing the health service delivery will be managed through this particular observatory. Existing health programs will be integrated through the API to create a common framework to identify their linkages to the selected KPIs. The observatories will support the ministry with a comprehensive view of the health service delivery, identification of the red flags in case a KPI is bad or something which is not met with, and comprehensive view of public health policy making. This is a maybe a nutshell which can be showing us. We have different HOCs or systems which are getting connected. In the middle you can see the HOC or a system which has already been built in our ministry. And in the third part is the public health observatory which is there, which is looking at the different data sets to come on to a meaningful understanding. So I will just skip. This is the pandemic management plan or what is there. This is just a glimpse when a passenger, this is for the points of entry and the other part is the other <coughs> aspect. What Radha Krishna sir had just very widely had told us. Based on the COVID experience, the country thought of having the points of entry with the quarantine facility, community surveillance, contractors, pressing laboratory testing and other things. They are all integrated together. And then we also have the digital in interventions like a web portal for the points of entry, community surveillance, laboratory testing, hospital preparedness under one platform. So that we can see exactly what is happening, where and where we need to act upon. So that is the thought behind it. Along with it, we have the logistic management, capacity building, risk communication, vaccine management, everything on a platform which will be helping us. So I'll just skip some of this slide because I feel I have just consumed my whole time. So this is some of the glimpses, what is there. We have a control room at the ministry, which we can just see where people are just working upon. Along with it, we have a number of NGOs which is there inside the ministry. One is located at the disaster management cell. Another one is located at NCDC. And there are several other NGOs that is getting connected over here virtually. And then we also have some states wherein we have offered them to develop their HOC. If anybody is interested, kindly write back to us at the state level so that we can help in implementation of the HOC so that we are prepared during the peace time and we can re respond to those disasters. I will stop here. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to speak. Thank you. We can have one or two questions. Sir, mic on, Carlo, mic, mic. Okay. Uh, now, I have the opportunity to invite Mr. W. Chuk Menchion, the lead global capacity building expert from USCDC Atlanta. <coughs> Sir, you will have 10 minutes for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, um, certainly an honor to uh, be here and to share with you today. Uh, and in the essence of time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. So what I'm going to share with you and talk to you about today is, um, I've called this a nation prepared, uh, primarily because I wanted to just show and share with you um, a couple of things that I think might be important for us to consider, um, even though uh, today we've heard quite a bit of discussion about the um, slides. We had quite a bit of discussion already about the um, uh, situation I think it was so eloquently put, put this morning, speaking of a whole of government approach, looking at the systems and processes necessary to collect a lot of the uh, interagency operability. And those are some of the areas that I wanted to uh, share with you um, briefly in uh, this time period. <laughs> Um, one thing I, I want to, uh, to look at and consider is uh, when we were looking at how we could connect a lot of our uh, departments and organizations together, it was necessary for us to come up with a what we call a PREP Act, which is the Preparedness and uh, All Hazard Re uh, Response Act. And we did that 
um, at, in the U.S. because there was a need to bring all of the different key stakeholders together and look at how we can structure and organize ourselves in a manner that would allow us to be able to function as one team fighting one type of uh, situation or event at hand. Uh, on the screen in front of you there, you'll see that this started with the Assistant Secretary for uh, Preparedness that coordinates the directives for uh, public health preparedness and response. And um, <clears throat> I had um, up the uh, specific mission that uh, we were focused on when, we do, when this was developed, and that was to prevent, pre prepare for, and uh, to recover from acts of uh, bioterrorism and other public health emergencies. And our specific goals there, if you look at that real quick, was to ensure uh, sustainable public health and medical readiness uh, for communities in the nation. And that, with the specific emphasis around uh, bioterrorism and um, uh, infectious diseases and things of that nature. Now, that doesn't mean that we exclude all other things. It's just that uh, those are managed by other specific agencies and they have specific uh, process and the protocol that would lead them um, in the direction that they are, char are charted to go. Our objectives uh, uh, under that was uh, for this particular uh, uh, talk is just to provide a primer, a broad overview of our national uh, response uh, framework and structure and to cite some importance of uh, having a whole of government, a whole of federal uh, perspective when preparing for and responding to specific um, uh, emergencies, outbreaks, and disasters. And then to highlight a few examples where I think um, uh, the events that happen really captures the essence of uh, why it's necessary to have this with the synergies between interagencies working well together, shattering and leveraging resources uh, at the same time. Uh, in the U.S., we are broken down into 10 what we call um, uh, our regions, and those are, we call them 10 FEMA regions, but you can uh, look at them, and each one of those regions have specific areas and uniquenesses about uh, the type of disasters and, and, and um, perils that uh, confront them. If you look on our west coast, they're, pr they're plagued primarily with wildfires and and uh, some floodings and things like that. And of course, this can happen uh, sometimes along the Mississippi River. But um, I just wanted you to see, first of all, how this was broken down uh, from an organizational construct and uh, unifying all of these different um, entities uh, under one operational um, uh, profile. So this organogram that I have here starts from the highest level with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and it cascades down doing a response with the Secretary's Operations Center that serves as the overall uh, global coordinating center for a response, and then each one of the operating divisions has sector responsibilities based on what their specific disciplines and areas of responsibility are. So we, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in the uh, coming slides, but I just wanted you to see that how we drill down under one national response framework. And um, even depending on what events are co we are confronted with, there may be different levels or tiers, if you will, of how we respond. This slide right here, although it may be a little bit busy, basically gives you a perspective on, at different tier levels, how we cascade down and look and examine uh, what resources and um, um, uh, staffing and things that, that are needed to be able to uh, deal with the emergency or the situation at hand. Now, the question becomes, uh, when we have different situations, what is exactly needed and what drove us or what drives one to look at, hey, we need to think about a more comprehensive way of working together. In the case of the United States, we're always dealing with some type of hurricanes, uh, situations of that where there's hurricanes or tornadoes, the natural disaster part of it, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency is the lead federal agency that deals with those type of events. But Hurricane Katrina was a different system altogether. Super large, it was like a super sale, one of the largest ones that we've experienced, um, and uh, did such, had such major catastrophic damage 
uh, in the United States, which brought a whole of government approach from not just the, um, the health and human services side, but also using and leveraging the resources of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And then again, when we were confronted with a global outbreak from H1N1, these type of events also necessitated and uh, brought to the forefront a need of having a comprehensive response approach, a comprehensive uh, preparedness approach to deal with types of emer emergencies and the synergistic connectivity of bringing these resources together and then deciding which sector, what departments would be instrumental in being able to leverage resources and take responsibility for that. So that brings me to talking about or sharing with you um, um, even the man-made disasters that we have. We had, um, many of you may have heard about the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. That was one of the other events that led us to looking at a whole of government and um, uh, federal to federal and federal to state down to the local communities because all of them were involved. We have a saying that all responses are local and actually they are, but it's also how you coordinate those responses and move and uh, administer the right um, uh, systems and resources to bring it there. And we do that in this case under a what we call a national response framework, which has a federal to federal component to it, as well as a regional level uh, component. When we talk about federal to federal, federal it's the coordination between interagencies that is important here. And what resources will be brought, be brought to bear and who has operational responsibility as well as statutory re responsibility. So our uh, all hazard preparedness act codified a lot of those things because there was a law passed that said how we, we would operate and work together and resources would be shared. And the only carve out was uh, Department of Defense and they were also leveraged in specific units through memorandums of agreements and understandings and things of that nature to uh, make this um, uh, work more efficiently. So support is usually uh, funded by a federal entity with, that has primary respons sector responsibility uh, for resolving this situation. And um, uh, in that particular case, um, for the um, for the uh, oil spill, it was uh, FEMA that had the, the greater part of the mandate. But then we had the uh, National Center for uh, Environmental activities that came to uh, support as well, given the environmental impact that was experienced in the local communities there with a number of the different um, economic engines for that, um, for that uh, situation impacted. This is um, what we call, uh, our, under our national response framework, it highlights the emergency support functions. So in, in our situation, we have divided up our uh, support functions up into 15 different support functions, and each one of them, whether it's transportation, communications, public safety, uh, even, um, even um, um, med medical preparedness and medical response is under ESF-8. Uh, e emergency support function 8 is, is specifically the uh, area in which uh, a lot of the work that I do with CDC is primary, primarily housed. And I'm gonna just share with you a little bit about that and then I won't be before you too much longer. Um, the CDC primary is the primary agency under ESFA working on the Department of Health and Human Services that actually administers or serves as the operating division that manages a lot of our uh, radi uh, radiation, chemical biohazards, uh, consulting and situations there, uh, public health information, making sure that the public is informed, understands uh, what is expected of them, and there's a collaboration that uh, we make sure that we have systems to communicate through, even during emergencies, the health alert networks, uh, a program we call EPX. These are ways we go from the emergency room where um, an individual may come and be clinically diagnosed or situations may first emerge, and that if we see a disease of some sort manifested there, that's cascaded all the way up to the highest levels of our um, government and different departments. Health surveillance, of course, having su good surveillance systems. Uh, you guys have excellent surveillance systems here. I was um, witness a lot of that working with Dr. Himishu 
and um, uh, the workers' healthy and safety and vector controls. These are just uh, uh, not an exhaustive list, but just a small uh, smattering of, of the different uh, things that we focus on. Now, beyond and cascading down from there, when we talk about the incident, uh, National Incident Management System, we short for short, we say NIMS, it is a comprehensive way of doing business uh, at the national level where we coordinate everything for um, incident management. So it also provides an example of uh, incident management regardless of the size, the scope, and the uh, location, or the complexity of what is happening around us. The NIMS system gives us the applicability of all jurisdictions. It's applicable to all jurisdictions regardless of function and discipline. So everyone functions under this one common operating system. And with that, that leads us down to the actual incident management system. Now, when we uh, do this at, in, in the U.S., we say um, ICS, an incident um, management system from the uh, spread, uh, incident command system. And in the global community, we refer to a lot of times as the incident management system. But we work closely with WHO. In particular, my uh, team, uh, we coordinate, collaborate, and even build curriculum for training with WHO in particular because we embrace and, uh, and follow the, the constructs that are laid out there as a signature for the international health regulations as well. So the question becomes, what are the benefits? Um, what are the benefits of um, working into a uh, national innocent management system? Of course, having a standardized approach to doing things. Uh, it was disclosed earlier that uh, having systems that work together uh, and is functional uh, as one cohesive unit is important. And I want to reemphasize that the way we've structured it with that. Now, I'm not saying that uh, the US has the only um, uh, best practice system. There are many that are out there. I just want to flag and highlight some opportunities that I see that, it, that has given us uh, beneficial opportunities of how we do business and having a comprehensive way of doing it that fits uh, the needs for all involved down to the local community level. And uh, underneath that, we uh, specifically have the, the incident management system. From that perspective, uh, we talk about the uh, ICS and all its critical components there, uh, how we leverage and utilize that. The ICS is a, um, is a globally recognized system that is rolled out and we, we, we and I say we meaning as a global community citizen, all of us are working toward having one common standard of unifying the way we conduct and manage um, uh, incident management uh, in a global perspective uh, with one voice, one way of doing it, so that individuals can be leveraged from one country to another in the case of major crises like COVID. So COVID has shown us that there is a compelling need to be flexible and adaptable uh, with our systems and understand how to operate them in a highly efficient manner. So what is the benefit of doing that? Of course, um, you know, uh, having it modular, scalable, and flexible, uh, I think some of those points were uh, shared a little bit earlier, and also um, uh, making sure that uh, there is common operating terminology that everyone understands. All of those are features and components that makes the incident management system uh, a system that is universally understood. Individuals are universally trained on them, and uh, they can uh, step in and function regardless of where you're in your home nation or home region or in, in any other country around the world, as long as there's one common uh, unifying standard there. Uh, some of the other things is having a common um, action plan, a way of doing business that, where we get things done in an efficient and um, organized manner. <clears throat> the last thing I want to share with you is just this little diagram that shows the interconnectedness of having a, um, a, a incident man a emergency management program where we look at all of the different features, components that goes into having a uh, unified operating system that's coherent, that's that's um, 
that's also uh, includes all of the processes, systems, staff stuff in, in, a, in a manner that gives you the flexibility to be able to scale up and apply the right size protocols depending on what that situation is. Now, uh, given that, um, again, I'm not saying that this is the only way, but this is a method, an organized way of doing it that I wanted to share with you uh, today that includes you know, making sure that the facilities are aligned uh, with proper staffing, uh, processes to include the technology, data and information is fed through them. So it's important for public health emergency operations centers to be leveraged and used in a, in a manner that gives that operating center the information and data it needs to be effective and functional for the leadership to make decisions through. Additionally, I'd like to say that when there is not an emergency, when there is no response, the uh, public health emergency operations centers also have a unique and specific function. And that function is, is to work from a preparedness perspective of what the, are the specific needs of a region or a community that can be addressed today. What are the plans? Do we have contingency plans? Have we done the proper risk assessments and things of that nature to make sure we are in the best position with using and leveraging best practices to make sure we are in, we are in good shape and ready for the next type of uh, pandemic response or disaster that may um, impact us. And with that, I want to thank you for your time, and I'm open and subject to your specific questions. Uh, we can have one question, just because we are skipping over time, sir, please. Okay, but the way it works in the U.S. is if there is a disaster that happens, for example, in the state of Florida, we just had, you know, um, a hurricane that hit that state. Whenever the uh, consequences or the results of that uh, disaster supersedes or goes beyond the level that the state can, can handle or manage themselves, and a request is sent up to uh, the, the president in most cases, we call that the Stafford Act. And when a Stafford Act is declared, federal resources come, FEMA comes to help support the uh, state. Now there are two different opportunities here. The first one is states have what we call emergency management compacts. Those compacts are designed, for example, and if you look at um, uh, the state of Florida, it's in FEMA Region 4. Well, North Carolina, Alabama, South Carolina are all states within that region. So those states have banded together and created their own emergency management compact so that if one state gets in trouble, uh, Alabama or Georgia can come and bring their uh, response staff to come and help them out. And, and that is also uh, driven by the Stafford Act too. We can bring in the closest resources to help mitigate that response. That's one level. If it supersedes the ability of all of those states, then uh, the Stafford Act would draw upon other federal resources from the a department level that can be brought to bear to uh, support and facilitate the um, response to the emergency and the recovery up to the way it was pre-event. Um, pre so those are the different venues we have. But the relationship from state to state is that they have emergency management compacts. They have agreements already in place and they have their own response capabilities. So if the Florida uh, State, they call it the CERT team, if the Florida State team is overwhelmed, then the Georgia State team may come in or North Carolina may come in to uh, administer uh, support to them. But the request has to go from the 
affected state to the neighboring state? From the governor of that state. From the governor of the state. Yes, the governor of the state has the authority to request additional resources and to request federal support uh, in disasters as well, too. So he can, he can request it from another state, and he can also request it up through the uh, federal system to uh, uh, have a, de a declaration declared. So the, the governor of the state would declare an emergency in his own state first, and then from that point on, he's applying their uh, resources, and then he might receive matching fundings and resources um, from the federal level to mitigate that response. In times of disaster, you know, all stops are removed and should be removed. And you do not care of anything else, just know when you leave whatever it takes. Now, in the wake of this, later on, later in the three years, later, the auditors come in. And uh, they are heartless people, you know. Like, <laughs> I'm sure they are heartless to the EU. Yeah, so, 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 how do you deal with that? Yes. <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, his question says, uh, after the disaster and funding has been expended, how do you deal with the idea of the audits? The first way you deal with it is to have a system in place before the audits occur. So we track those. We track those. Reasons. We have form. We have different forms where we, when we are applying the logistics, managing the cost of the emergency, uh, we have funding sources. Each state has its own contingency fund. There's a, a federal, there's a state contingency fund, and then there is a, a federal fund that um, is, uh, is also leveraged against that. So before the auditors get there, whoever is appointed as the incident manager has also the uh, responsibility to manage the funding and how they are expended and, for, and document what they are used for. So under that incident management system, you will see one of the different uh, general uh, support staff is finance and administration. So under the finance and administration, they capture the hours worked of each one of the staff, what um, uh, re uh, 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 resources, protocols, medical countermeasures, all of those things that expenditures are made on, they capture all of that and they document what the cost was so they didn't give account when they did. Now, in cases where that hasn't happened as well, you're right, there is um, a lot of uh, brutal wrangling, so to speak, uh, of trying to make it right. But you have to have documentation and justification for that, and you do it as well. So we have individuals that are earmarked to manage the financial aspects of that, even while we are in the middle of it, going forward. Other questions? Uh, I think uh, we saw in the Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so it was a nice discussion, I think, uh, because we are already had adopted for this best practice and uh, redesignated as incident response system. And uh, we included actually finance and administration along with logistics. Instead of four sections, operation planning, finance, administration, and logistics, we have only three sections now in India. So, but the system is same. So we have also the SOPs for that as well. So I thank you very much for your presentation and the elaboration. Now we have the last presentation of this session by Dr. Himan Shukyo Pahandi, who is Joint Director of IDSP and CDC. Uh, I would request Sir kindly constrain it by 10 minutes. We are putting the clock in the presentation so that the speaker can kindly restrain the time. Please. Sorry, because you are partner also, so I take this as my life to make this kind of request to you. Respected chairpersons, eminent uh, uh, personalities uh, of the dais. Thank you. I'll quickly talk about uh, what uh, Dr. Pradeep Kasnavis has started uh, as uh, the health EOCs. Uh, that was more of uh, a bird's eye view of uh, looking from the national level. Uh, as to how do we get uh, the bigger operating picture. I'll be talking about uh, surveillance uh, public health emergency response centers, uh, which operate uh, much closer to where uh, the, the event unfolds, uh, the outbreak is happening, uh, probably much more closer to the community. And uh, I'll try to do it in uh, the next 10 minutes, uh, as is being uh, instructed. Uh, 
So public health emergency response centers we have all seen uh, throughout uh, this morning uh, that uh, this is basically a facility for an emergency team, uh, a physical location where an emergency respond, responding team uh, can sit together and they can uh, work towards management of information and resources. Uh, in our case, for National Center for Disease Control, its branches, the metropolitan surveillance units uh, which are to be established under the PMA team, uh, this would be pertaining to disease surveillance and outbreak response. Uh, the objectives uh, of uh, these PHERCs uh, are toned down version of uh, what uh, the health emergency operation centers do at a, at a larger level. Uh, during an emergency, they are supposed to act uh, as command centers uh, to manage outbreaks, uh, public health emergencies, or any other disasters. Uh, while during peacetime, uh, they, they would be concerned with uh, strengthening the disease surveillance and response. This would also involve uh, keeping a watch uh, and plan, which is uh, one very important aspect of uh, this uh, EOCs or PHERCs. Uh, uh, these are, they, they are uh, poised to serve as uh, an advanced solution in terms of operational uh, of an operational PHERC uh, to, to deal with surveillance and adequate response. Uh, and uh, a robust surveillance mechanism uh, would, is, is uh, the backbone of uh, this uh, PHERCs. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the surveillance uh, uh, mechanism in a little more detail uh, and how the IDSP currently is uh, playing that role. Uh, these activities have been uh, talking about, they've been talked about uh, through, throughout this uh, morning and the various uh, sessions. I won't go into the details of this. Essentially, they aid uh, as uh, tools uh, to help the policy makers take effective action uh, in, a, in a timely fashion. Plans and SOPs are the key, key components uh, for any EOC or any uh, emergency response center. Uh, so plans uh, are, are, are expected to be prepared uh, during the peacetime uh, when uh, the disaster is, uh, when we are not operating in a disaster situation and then acting as per the SOPs uh, during, during the disasters. Uh, for uh, NCDC, we've had, uh, these are the common conditions that we deal with, uh, we respond to uh, as, as uh, central teams are deployed, uh, consisting of experts from NCDC. And uh, therefore the plan encompasses uh, these possible scenarios. Uh, the NCDC infectious disease uh, outbreak plan essentially revolves around those conditions that I've just uh, mentioned. Uh, and it includes operational, scientific, and technical information uh, and also describes uh, the procedures that are to be put in place uh, at the level of NCDC. And uh, this is a living document. Uh, that means that it has to be continuously updated uh, at, on an annual basis at least. Uh, the SOPs uh, are also important part of this plan. They follow the planning process. Uh, so the plan is followed by standard operating procedures uh, and uh, they are very much uh, required uh, just to give an example, even operating, powering up uh, the emergency operation center uh, requires uh, a set of SOPs. Not anybody can do that who isn't trained and who doesn't follow those SOPs. Even powering up the center is, is a challenge. Uh, so far, we have prepared at National Center for Disease Control uh, these many SOPs uh, which deal with the different divisions as to what they should be doing uh, when, when an event occurs and uh, when the emergency operation center is activated. Uh, so different divisions have different roles to play and accordingly different sets of SOPs that they operate on. Uh, the flow of information essentially starts uh, uh, with uh, monitoring the events uh, in the media through the weekly reports. Uh, now we have a daily reporting system uh, so monitoring the data that flows in through the surveillance system, uh, evaluated by a team, uh, which is uh, the watch team, uh, which does the job of uh, scanning those events and highlighting it, flashing it to where the action is required, uh, ultimately leading on uh, to the essential tasks as per the SOPs which are to be performed and logging those tasks. Uh, just five minutes uh, about uh, IDSB, the program that currently uh, uh, is uh, in a transition stage in the sense that uh, it is uh, using real-time uh, electronic surveillance system for uh, reporting case-based data on 33 plus health conditions. Uh, the main task of this being uh, early warning signals to generate, to detect them, uh, to take effective public health action once those early warning signals are recognized, logged in by the system, uh, 
through a cadre of rapid response teams which are trained workers, uh, which is also the mandate of the program to ensure that these are present uh, up to the district level at least and even below that uh, with the aim of reducing morbidity and mortality uh, due to communicable disease outbreaks. Currently, there are, uh, as, as was the earlier version of the program, data being collected from the community, from uh, the health facilities, by the doctors, and from the laboratories which form the reporting, the reporting network of IDSP. Uh, a snapshot of uh, what are the diseases currently under IDSP mandate. Uh, so lots of zoonotic diseases, lots of diseases which have uh, a One Health uh, perspective, uh, uh, vaccine preventable diseases, uh, vac uh, uh, vector uh, one uh, diseases, uh, and uh, other syndromes. Uh. The major achievements of IDSP, uh, what have we done in the almost about two decades in 2024, we'll be observing two decades of IDSP in the country. So it has created a nationwide surveillance and response network uh, with dedicated resources uh, up to the district level. Uh. A central surveillance unit, 36 state surveillance units, and 750 plus district surveillance units uh, was probably the backbone of the COVID-19 response uh, that uh, the government of India embarked upon, uh, that there was a cadre of uh, trained people who were responsible uh, for doing surveillance and contact tracing and everything uh, that went along with the initial part of COVID-19 response. Uh, 412 district uh, public health laboratories, out of which 350 are already functional, uh, and a network of 15 state uh, reference laboratories. Uh, this has led to uh, detection and response to diseases of public health importance in the past, like COVID-19 is still ongoing, uh, Zika, Nipah, CCHF, KFD, etc., to name a few. Uh, and uh, a robust event-based surveillance system has been established, which currently states are also using. It has been uh, replicated in some instances, even at the district level, by the district surveillance units. Uh, IDSP has been involved uh, in uh, every single avian influenza outbreak in the country that uh, we have responded to. IDSP has been a part of the team that has uh, implemented the contingency plan. More than 20,000 outbreaks have been detected and responded to by the system. Uh, and they have, these contributions have been recognized and lauded by the country leadership and the team. I will not talk about this in detail, just the important lessons learned. Uh, preparedness and response systems need to be strengthened before an event occurs. Right now is the time uh, when we need to further strengthen them, uh, and it's good we are talking about public health emergency and disasters. Disasters have been defined. Public health emergencies in the country are yet to be defined. So I think one of the tasks uh, that, that we would uh, be looking forward and we should be dealing with is uh, defining public health emergencies. Uh, investments in public health systems, uh, they yield rich dividends. Probably it's been a joker's cry over and over again uh, that investment needs to be made. Uh, but till the time they are made, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, repeating the same uh, thing over and over again. Uh, the basic principle of risk assessment and communication, they sound simple, uh, but the simplest things are the most difficult uh, to implement during a crisis situation. Uh. And in a complex pandemic like COVID-19, we have seen uh, that there are and there shall be, uh, even in future, multiple sources of data. Reconciliation of data arriving at a single figure is probably uh, not what is meant, what is required, uh, but uh, the data discrepancies need to be acknowledged and we should be moving forward with the response rather than looking at uh, just the data part of it. Uh, a command and control structure, which is what we are talking about today, whether it's emergency operation center, whether it's health emergency response center, surveillance center, uh, that, that helps in coordinating a multi-agency response. Uh, and documentation of best practices and lessons learned is vital. This has also been said before. Uh, we, we deal with the emergencies uh, in an excellent way uh, when the crisis comes. Uh, but what we fail to do probably is document those lessons uh, so that later on they are available and they can serve as uh, guidance documents for our future responses. Uh, so I had the uh, demo, but I'll, I'll skip over the demo part of uh, how currently IDSP, IHIP operates probably for some other session. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, I'll be willing to take. Thank you very much. Yes, one question, please. Hand mic, Jayjay. Yeah, this is an excellent job by NCDC. That's true, because uh, unless you know what is happening in our country to surveillance, but I'd like to focus on the syndromic surveillance, like respiratory infection and all. So, primarily, we are looking at COVID and influenza right now. 
But here, Dr. Radha Krishna is telling there are you know, like respiratory sensitivity or virus that come in the US, and there are at least 30 respiratory infections that is circulating. So we must look at to identify the etiology part. So, uh, yeah, sorry, if that's your question uh, and it doesn't have a second component to it. Just, just, just one second, and to look at the like, inside of kind of thing, we need to see whether these are all circulating viruses or bacteria, or it is something new coming down. Because if it is new, it's a challenging area. So there are two components uh, to answer your question. The one is the research part of it as to if a person suffers from severe acute respiratory illness, then what is uh, the etiology uh, of, of that particular presentation? Uh, then uh, ICMR is currently in a research mode uh, doing uh, multi-pathogen testing, uh, the virological part of it uh, as to what causes SARI. The second part of it uh, is uh, SARI surveillance itself. Uh, so moving forward with the COVID surveillance, the government of India has now embarked upon a revised COVID surveillance strategy, which is essentially monitoring SARI cases. So 1,350 sites have been identified across the country and they are supposed to report all the SARI cases and we are doing it on a weekly basis, we are providing them a feedback uh, as to what is the SARI trend in the country. Ultimately, we need to know that if the SARI cases are in, if there is a virus or whatever agent that is circulating, is it resulting in severe acute respiratory illness? That's our primary concern. And if it is resulting in that, then we should be knowing what is the etiology behind that. So linking the two is the way forward. Yeah, so I think you have a question, sir. Basically for the community-based surveillance for which they is collecting the data on a real-time basis to act upon the disease outbreak. That is the basic intention. What you are asking is the respiratory sensitive virus where the incidence is very low as the bed. So for that we have the central-based surveillance being carried out by ITSP under the influence the lab network where the central sites are linked to a medical college and then we come to know exactly what is the positive organization. So that we can Thank you. So I think it's time to close uh, the session. May I request the coordinator of this session to kindly conclude it. Uh, sorry, before we conclude, I have the duty to request uh, the co-chair to present the summary of the discussion that we had in our session. Thank you, yeah. Professor Surya Prakash, and I will do this quickly. I know we're constrained by time. I want to thank all of our panelists for their very interesting and informative presentation. I think from Professor Radhakrishnan, we learned about the importance of decentralized war rooms and intersectoral collaboration in Tamil Nadu's COVID-19 response. Also about the importance of sustainable funding at the district level and empowering and retaining skilled health resource staff in responses moving forward. Also the need to keep up surveillance and strengthen systems during peace times so that they can function most efficiently during times of emergency. From Dr. Pradeep Kasnovas, we learned about international and unified operational capacity for global health emergencies and about the role of health emergency operations centers, including a role for health sector disaster preparedness and response, human resource development for emergency services, and the role that PMFM is playing in building up the health infrastructure to support both the operational awareness, situational awareness during peacetime and emergency response capacities during time of emergency. From Mr. Chuck Menchion, we learned about the national response framework as it exists in the US and how it supports a central response and states in their response to health emergencies and disaster management. We also learned about the uh, NIMS, the National Incident Management System, and Incident Command Structure, uh, which is being carried out similarly in both India and the United States. From Dr. Hamachu, we learned about public health emergency response centers and the role that IDSP is playing in serving a national surveillance function and in supporting the ability of public health emergency response centers to be a command center in peacetime and strengthen disease surveillance and response during times of public health emergencies. I will, with that wrap up, hand it back to the chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Luna. Uh, now, I will just close the session with the chair you know, because uh, the things can be said in small words and sentences rather than big essays. Uh,
आता है कि जगाना आता है उसे कई तरीकों से जगाना आता है उसे कई तरीकों से घरों पर दस्तक देने खुदा नहीं आता पढ़े रहो सहमे हुए यूं पढ़े रहो सहमे हुए यूं सहमे हुए जियों की तरह अगर हवाओं के पर बांधना नहीं आता लेट मी ट्रांसलेट इट इन इंग्लिश दैट नेचर रिमाइंड्स अस गिव्स अस अवेकनिंग कॉल्स एंड लेट्स अस थ्रू दिस वेरियस टाइप्स ऑफ डिजास्टर्स बीट पेंडेमिक सास और एवियन फ्लू और एनीथिंग एल्स फ्लड साइक्लोन आर्टक्वेक्स बट वी हैव टू लर्न टू टेम डिजास्टर रादर देन गेटिंग टेम्ड बाय देम एंड लेट्स स्ट्रेंथन आवरसेल्स आवर सिस्टम्स our society our science to be sustainable safer and uh, resilient against them so i wish you all the best and thank you very much for allowing me to chair this session and thank all the speakers along with my co-chairs uh, for this thank you very much uh, thank you sir uh, on behalf of organizing team i'm very grateful for the respected panelists and the distinguished speakers for the session for their valuable deliberations and suggestions particularly related to the public health emergency and disaster management infrastructure and capacity building now i request the respected chair professor surya prakash to present a token of appreciation to the co chair dr j radhakrishnan sir <coughs> Now I request the respected chair to present a token of appreciation to the co-chair, uh, Dr. Ramana. Now request the coach chair, Professor Surpreet, to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Himanshu Chauhan. I request the coach chair, Professor Surpreet, to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Chal, Mr. Chal. So without delay, let's move to the last and final session of the National Conference of Public Health Emergency and Disaster Management. Yes. So oh, for the third session.
So for the third final session, we have uh, on public health emergency and disaster and disaster access. So now we move to the, the session on the very interesting session with a uh, panel consist of expert and the best practices from which are implemented in and around India. Now I take the privilege to welcome the chair of the session, Sri Ajit Kesar, Parvok Yadav Secretary, and co-chair Dr. Mujavar Abdusraj, Parvok Ramal, and DM Mishra. Now I will hand over the stage to the respected chair of the session. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me uh, just mention at the outset that uh, I think some delegates have tried to attach back uh, to the work home. So I think we will have to curtail the amount of the, the length of time which people uh, can take for this session. I think it will be limited to five minutes only. So uh, the, uh, this session, we are dealing with the public health emergency and disaster management best practices. So, uh, so along with the, my co-chair, I would now invite the first uh, speaker. I, I'm going to dispense with my introductory remarks. I'll just say that, uh, uh, you know, the practices that we are going to hear about, the Kumbh Mela, for instance. Uh, this is something which is unique to this country. You have on a peak day in the Kumbh Mela in Ulava, uh, something like, uh, I don't know, about 30 million uh, people who assemble, and on other days it is much less. And then you have, a, uh, on a smaller scale, you have a Kumbh Mela in the Dwar, which is and this takes place when the, the main home takes place in the Kalbi, as we all know. But the manner in which it is handled uh, is something which bears retelling. But now I invite the, the first speaker, uh, which is uh, Mr. Mr. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, respected chairs, uh, respected participants, and all the dignitaries present in the room. Today, I will take you through the establishment of the Field Public Health Emergency Operations Center at Komila Uttarakhand um, that was uh, steered by uh, Dr. Pankaj uh, Singh, State Noble Officer, Uttra, IDSP Uttarakhand, and it was supported by National Center for Disease Control and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in India. In line with the suggestions uh, made by uh, Dr. Manshu Johan about how best practices need to be implemented, uh, this is one collaboration <coughs> that happened between the state of Uttarakhand, uh, the National Center for Disease Control, and the um, uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Country of India to establish a public health uh, emergency operation center at Kumbhmela. Can we go to the next slide, please? So it became one of the uh, case studies, uh, so to speak, to add to the, thank you, to add to the uh, evidence of how to manage public health emergencies at a mass gathering. 
the objectives of this case were essentially uh, to uh, elaborate on the framework of, of establishing a field public health emergency operations center at a mass gathering to document the importance of stakeholder and multi-agency coordination, which we essentially saw uh, was instrumentalized through a, a public health emergency operations center, and then the importance of in planning capacity building that played a key role in managing public health uh, and uh, public health emergencies at uh, the Kumbhira. And the fourth and final uh, objective was to identify the risks that um, a mass gathering, uh, health risks that a mass gathering carries along with it. The methodology that was uh, adopted to actually uh, draft this case study was a qualitative uh, uh, research uh, approach, uh, strategy, and uh, the methods that were adopted were that of, in of interview and focus group discussions, wherein members from um, different levels of strategic, ta tactical, and operational were um, interviewed and there were focus group discussions with them. And uh, uh, definitely the sections of this case study were divided into strategic, tactical, and operational because um, that's where, so at the strategic level, we had the decision making that uh, took place at the at the tactical, at the operational level, um, plans, procedures uh, were made, uh, protocols were made, and tactical, uh, there was implementation of everything that was essentially planned at the middle level. Uh, this was essentially, this is essentially the structure of the field PHUC that was established at the Kodnika. Now the field PHUC had two main components, uh, that was a data surveillance unit and the watch desk. The data surveillance unit ensured aggregation of uh, data, that is uh, every day how many patients are coming in, what diseases are they uh, uh, showing, or what symptoms they are showing. Um, so these were the functions that the, um, uh, uh, the first component took care of, which was aggregation of data to generate early warning signals. and. Um, uh, to, to make a single report of, of all the data that was received from uh, the IHIP board, from the IHIP, from the district control room, from the watch desk as well. Watch desk had around 10 uh, call operators who worked around uh, uh, across three shifts. Uh, watch desk also ensured multi sectoral coordination. It also was the was the point from where RRTs were activated. It was also a point from where information was shared with the public. and. Um, uh, the, yeah, information sharing with different sectors as well. So let's say there is there is issue of water. So then the water department was contacted through the watch desk. The information that came in to, uh, at the watch desk was through the devotees, um, uh, through the data surveillance unit. District control room was sending information to the watch desk. Whereas for for the data surveillance unit, from uh, the information came in from field uh, health units from the uh, personnel who were deployed and the watch desk as well. So the two units were constantly communicating with each other as well. So the journey, so to speak, was uh, that initially a meeting was held with the Secretary of Health where an NCDC participated. There was, uh, there was uh, state um, uh, members from the state as well. So there was DG from the Department of Health and Family Welfare from the state and there was um, the State Noble Officer, IDSP, Uttarakhand. Uh, there were CD members from CDC as well, where the concepts of public health emergency management and the, and how to instrumentalize all of that through a field public health emergency operations center uh, were discussed. And then there was a green signal to go ahead and to establish a field uh, public health emergency operations center. Uh, slowly, that is Dr. Pankaj uh, Singh, who is the state noble officer at, uh, of IDSP at Uttarakhand. He he's, uh, started meeting with. Uh, different uh, departments to talk about the uh, to talk about the protocols, the plan uh, development, um, and then the third picture you see uh, that and uh, the HEOC is the infrastructure of the HEOC is being set up in Rishikul, and that is uh, Dr. Rajesh Sharma from CDC who is overseeing the setup, and then in the fourth picture you can see uh, the, the operationalization of the FPHEOC. The output was that we had a single reporting system which essentially ensured information from all the units of IHRP watch, watch desk, there were rumor registers, there was different documentation that was taken care of uh, that, uh, that that formed a single report for the authorities to look at. There was a robust system, an IT-enabled surveillance system that was um, established. There was also sensitization of the leadership of people at the management of, of the importance of the field pages.
and the recommendations were that of, uh, that early warning signals should be established from all the departments and all the sectors so that they can actually speak to each other. Institutionalization of a public health emergency operations center and deploy the person. The importance of field epidemiology and the importance of surveillance was also highlighted quite well during this um, particular uh, case.
उस थीरा के टूल को हम लोगों ने इंडियन कॉन्टेक्स में अडॉप करते हुए एक क्वेश्चनर डेवलप किया था और उस क्वेश्चनर को हम लोगों ने ब्लॉक लेवल डिस्ट्रिक्ट लेवल आपका ग्राम पंचायत लेवल पे उसका उस क्वेश्चनर के हम लोगों ने फोकस ग्रुप डिस्कशन किया कि इंटरव्यूज किए और इसमें हम लोगों ने फोकस किया ग्राम पंचायत में जो हमारे लोकल जो हमारे कम्युनिटी इन्फ्लुएंसर्स हैं ग्राम प्रधान हैं पंच हैं आशा वर्कर्स हैं आपदा मित्र हैं या लोकल जो भी एन हैं उनको हम लोगों ने कॉर्डिनेट करके ये की इन्फॉर्मेट हम लोगों ने किए ये असेसमेंट करने के बाद हम लोगों ने एनालिसिस किया कि ये जो हमारी ग्राम पंचायत है इसका कम्युनिटी प्रोफाइल क्या क्या है और इसमें हम लोगों ने मेजर दस थ्रेड्स आइडेंटिफाई किया और कम्युनिटी की कैपेबिलिटीज भी हम लोगों ने आइडेंटिफाई की कि वहाँ की कैपेबिलिटीज क्या क्या है और इन कैपेबिलिटीज और कैपेबिलिटीज uh, और इनकी इम्पैक्ट इम्पैक्ट और प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ हजार्ट को देखते हुए हम लोगों ने ये सिलेक्ट किया ये डिसाइड किया हुआ है कि ये जो ग्राम पंचायत है ये अभी इन इन कैपेबिलिटी उसमें आता है और इसमें अभी बहुत ज़्यादा इम्प्रूवमेंट की जरूरत है जिसे हम आगे एक प्रोजेक्ट के थ्रू आगे लेके जाएंगे ये जो है Uh, the honorable minister of the state uh, 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 
um, in this, uh, for our home affairs and I hope everyone has received this uh, summary report. So I will be not going uh, much detail on uh, this and uh, just uh, want to say that uh, three things have uh, fabricated the environment uh, for this uh, weekly webinar series but was the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that uh, uh, underscored the importance of, uh, uh, of three S, uh, staff, staff and system, human, uh, staff that is human resources, staff that is uh, robust infrastructure and system, all the guidelines, policies and everything. So, and uh, another point is that uh, the Honorable Prime Minister in his standpoint he has highlighted that we need to learn uh, that uh, we need to learn from the emergen uh, this uh, public health emergencies or disaster, whatever you said. Uh, whatever opportunity we receive from these uh, catastrophic events, we should not uh, waste it and we need to document it properly. So, um, so all these things fabricated for the uh, connection of this uh, weekly webinar series. Initially, it was for only uh, 12 episodes, but uh, on receiving the recommendation from the subject matter expert as well as from uh, our uh, the participants, uh, so this episode, uh, this um, series has been extended to 24 episodes, and uh, this is also the joint venture of uh, NIDM with NCDC and uh, CDC. So uh, this was uh, the, probably the first time uh, I can, uh, in my knowledge, that. Uh, these three organizations uh, came up, uh, uh, came up uh, uh, to bring on board to a uh, crucial subject that is public health emergency and uh, disaster management. Uh, it was evident by uh, COVID-19 that these two subjects can't be uh, separated. This, uh, we can't deal with these two subjects uh, subject in silos. So these three organizations, this uh, trinity, they bring uh, this uh, two crucial subjects in uh, one platform. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, it is not that um, all the three, uh, the head of all the three organizations, they sat together and they just decided that okay, uh, we will go for a webinar series, sort of tell episode webinar series. Uh, you can go through uh, this uh, summary report. It is uh, clearly mentioned here. A, pro a proper protocol was uh, developed uh, for conduction of this webinar series. Uh, around five to six months were uh, invested uh, in uh, in investigating all these uh, uh, episodes. So a pool of uh, experts, subject matter experts from the field of public health emergency as well as from the field of disaster management, uh, they were all uh, identified and as you can see, uh, we have taken not only for, uh, from national level, we have taken the experts from the international level, from the national level as well as from the district level as well as uh, those who were working at the ground roots level. So we uh, create a um, um, pool of mixed um, mix, uh, subject matter experts for this whole webinar series. And uh, we were able to uh, outreach more than 700 um, online learning communities or more than 700, seven, sorry, 7,000 uh, online learning communities where uh, they attended this uh, uh, 24 episodes of webinar series. And these are some of the feedbacks that we received uh, from uh, our participants. And uh, this uh, today, our today's uh, national conference on public health emergency and disaster management, it is uh, one of the uh, recommendations that we received from the subject matter experts as well as uh, from our uh, participant. And uh, these are the, some of the key of, uh, outcomes of uh, this uh, uh, weekly webinar series. Uh, as I mentioned, that um, the renowned experts from the field of public health emergency and disaster management, they joined the cause to enhance uh, comprehensive uh, capabilities uh, of uh, our nation in managing the public threats of public health emergency and disasters. And uh, it, uh, this uh, webinar series also provides a platform uh, for both uh, subject matter experts to exchange their knowledge, innovations, and uh, ideas so that the capacities of uh, relevant stakeholders, not only the stakeholders, I will say, I will. Uh, see the, uh, also the communities uh, to, um, uh, to enhance their capacity the, uh, for uh, public health emergency and disaster management and documentation of learning and this uh, uh, this summary report is uh, whatever uh, you can go through. I will uh, request all the experts as well as uh, all our delegates to go through this uh, summary report and uh, to share your feedbacks on 
in this summit. Thank you very much. Started with uh, its journey with eight uh, battalions, and now we are having uh, 16 battalion under section 441. NDRF was established, and across the country we are having 16 battalion based on the vulnerability profile. They are there, and uh, because my topic is about CBRN, so we are having a CBRN team, 18 CBRN team in uh, one battalion, and total 47 member team is there with one battalion. And every member of the force is equal. Uh, every member of the force is trained for the CBRN emergencies. Now, a CBRN is not a very frequent phenomena, but it is uh, related to sufferings, not it, not death, but it is uh, the sufferings which makes it very important and a uh, uh, phenomena to be discussed. Uh, forget about the many disasters because we don't have the time. Then Chernobyl, it was a radiological disaster. The classical example of NATEC, natural uh, accident, uh, natural calamities in the technological disasters. Then these are the uh, very recent incident and the Syrian chemical. Now what are the hazards associated with that? So these are the uh, nerve agent, discharge agent, choking agents in World War One and Two. It was made to kill. But our uh, threat is the MES unit, major accidental hazard units, which is across the country, and there are many more which is not, which are not the MES unit, but as uh, dangerous and deadly as the MES units, and the incident may occur in the where the man, the manufacture where they store or during the transportation, it may lead to explosion, fire, leakage uh, or um, leakage or uh, slippage, but. Uh, about the biological disasters, everybody know we have talked about a lot of, uh, about the COVID. This one is the final radiological and nuclear disasters. It, it sta started with the uh, Robert, Robert Oppenheimer, the very infamous quote that uh, quote from the Gita. It was a verse from Gita that now I'm become the dead, the destroyer of the world. It was the Trinity, uh, Trinity, uh, I mean testing of the nuclear bombing and orphan source may be a danger for us like the Mayapuri RDD radiological dispersive device criticality accident uh, primarily or uh, naturally at the nuclear uh, power plants and PPs transportation and finally the nuclear blast so this is the incident whenever there is any incident we uh, the IRS is activated sir has already told about the ICS so this is the Indian version IRS, this is the responsible officer whenever there is a radiological emergency. So, uh, then necessarily district collector will be the responsible officer and NDRF, we are here. We are here as a single resource or task force. So, our response will be depend on identification of threat. We are having a lot of detectors for that. These are the detectors. For protection, we are having uh, this system, the visor, cargo decoder, and ERG in our mobile. So what we can do, we can just uh, enter the gas which it is, it is, and we can calculate what is the safety distance, what PP should be used. So this is the personal protective equipment and DRF is having. So level of protection depends on this ERG, what the ERG is telling to us. Though it is uh, in books, it is also written there. And the level of protection is level A, B, and C depending on the skill protection and the Respiratory protection. Another tool, Aloha, it is decision support system. We uh, we enter the many parameters like the location, like the GR, like the temperature, like the uh, temperature inversion, like uh, humidity, and we keep on enter enter 40 to 45 parameters and ultimately gives this KML file. And when we superimpose this KML file on the uh, 
uh, Google map. It gives that what area should be evacuated. And this is uh, for the Muradabad I have prepared for the Muradabad exercise. Then we do the zone marking, hot zone and cold zone in hot zone. Only search and rescue is carried out. Uh, sorry, only evacuation in the warm zone. We have to uh, decontamination and medical and the rest staging area is command post in the cold zone. Decontamination we do. We do the physical decontamination of personnel or the victims. It is done in nine steps. OPCW has given these nine steps. There is no alteration. We use it as they have told us. And now final takeaway. These are the last four slides for you because time is very limited. Whenever you are here because we are having the personal protective equipment and the training, but the public uh, who, is, who is stuck in such uh, environment, a piece of warm cloth, then for eye protection, use goggles and you can tape it with a normal tape, a cap, scar, whatever you are having and your hair should be covered by that. And overall track suit, trouser, see this, these are the improvised protection equipment, a cloth, Polythene cover, whatever, dry ata, cow dung, ye sab kuch ho sakta hai. This is my final, uh, by feeling to prepare, you are preparing to feel by Benjamin Franklin. You can just click on the Benjamin Franklin. Or last me Surya sir, ek aur, ki, uh, we cannot avert the disasters, but we can minimize by the knowledge. Hari ne bishan hunkar kiya, apna sarup vistar kiya. डगमग डगमग दिग्गज बोले भगवान कुबित होकर बोले जंजीर बढ़ाकर साथ मुझे आजा दुर्योधन बाद मुझे सो वी कैन नॉट अवॉइड डिजास्टर बट वी कैन रिड्यूस द लॉस ऑफ लाइफ एंड प्रॉपर्टी जय हिंद chemical and biological agents when they are released into the environment they can have a lot of effect on the human and animal health. So there are two kinds of things that can happen. One is unintentional release, for example an industrial disaster, accident or a natural outbreak that we have been seeing the natural outbreak and epidemic. But intentionally that can also come from some terrorist group or some rogue state. So that can happen and all the international treaties that are available now are not restricting to non-state actors. So there is always a great problem for the non-state actors. So that just to be looked at because the CWC, the Chemical Open Prohibition Treaty or Convention, that restricts all the state parties. But the non-state actors, the concerns is always there. So coming to the biological disaster, it is even more uh, challenging as you have seen uh, over the time uh, last three years. Because biological disaster, the main issue is that you are not knowing that somebody is doing. Because it can be done in a clandestine way, and a lot of time was elapsed by the time you will be knowing. That's why I talked about the syndrome of surveillance. Unless you are actually identifying very quickly something is happening in a remote corner of our country, that will keep on expanding, and that cascading event, uh, as in the morning somebody was talking about the, it's a matter of 36 hours, an agent can go from one place to another corner of the world. So that's the challenging scenario we are we all live in this country, in this whole world basically. And uh, biological agents are like all chemical and nuclear agents. There are a lot of the biotechnological progress that is made. And you can have kind of variants, the variant of concerns you are looking at. And some are made naturally, some can be made artificial because they are very small genome. And it is actually possible through synthetic genome approach, biology approach to have a telomer agent. So that will have a devastating effect. So now coming to the chem defense, there are three, four important parts basically. One is detection. Detection is the most important thing. You need to detect at the right time 
so that all other measures can be taken. That can be either on site or off site. On site is the best one. Then once you are knowing detecting, then you have to go for the protection on the medical counter measures or the decontamination. Decontamination is primary of importance in case of chemical emergency, not not for biological emergency. We have seen in COVID cases, people have been using those kind of uh, structures where. Uh, I mean, uh, decontaminants have been sprinkled, but those are not much useful. And uh, I told about detection, protection, decontamination, and modeling, how to detect these things. These are some of the handheld equipments. These are available with chemical agents, which are actually very important for uh, chemical hazards uh, detection. And there are uh, production measures that can be taken up in a subsequent way. Biological emergency, uh, we all are aware of the situations uh, since COVID time, but there are also some biological detectors and identifiers, those are available which can be used for the on-site detection. But these can only be stressed in some of the high high priority assets, uh, but not in everywhere else. So syndromic surveillance, we have to reserve to look at uh, actually identifying the first cases or the typical beginning, beginning of the cases. So protection, we all know about this thing, there are individual protection as you have seen PP. And just to talk about PP, when the COVID-19 comes up, there are PPs since swine flu time, but most of the PPs are not up to the standard where it should be used. So, but uh, through the efforts, uh, uh, very quickly within the last two, three months uh, since the onset of pandemic, India has become self-sufficient in developing PP which are actually quite good way of, because they have to give protection for the fast responders and they make that make your fast responder confident to face this challenging zone. So that is very, very important. And there are uh, kind of things where you can uh, basically go for the quarantines, quarantine shelters are there, medical protections, even decontamination, there are shelters where you can decontaminate, as has been told in the warm zones that can be stressed. And these are a couple of uh, lot of biological agents, there are a lot of detection systems available. So coming to the response part, so there are two parts, before the incident defense and after the incident defense. Coming to the before the incidents, because these are not invisible kind of uh, things, all chemical and biological things. So basically the intelligence gathering is the most important thing. You have to be aware prior and what kind of agents might be used. Generally you can take that kind of uh, precautionary measures and uh, impart training and uh, resource mobilization. As I told about PP, vaccines, even medical order measures, something happening in Ebola, there are some experimental medicines are available in top uh, developed countries. There, those kind of resources are not available to anyone else in the world. So we need to have some national stockpiling of resources so that in case that will be required, it can be used. As you have seen in case of uh, oxygen concentrator and even decon system, everything is required to be kept prior to this. And the time of uh, incident or post incident, uh, the response phase that already been covered by NDRA. So recovery and restoration has to be done at the earliest time. And training, training is the most important part. Unless the awareness is created and people, particularly the first responders are trained, actually things cannot be managed. So before concluding, I like to again emphasize that we need to have cross-sector coordination, what we have seen in COVID times, that is the best way to go forward. And awareness through constant training of all stakeholders, that must be in place so that uh, things can be taken up. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening everyone. I know this is almost like the graveyard shift, but uh, good evening uh, respected chair and uh, co-chair and uh, dignitaries uh, present here. 
Um, I would like to, I have a very brief presentation and uh, I'll, I'll skip slides uh, where I have some uh, data on the impact, etc. Uh, but I just wanted to start with uh, something that uh, Dr. Himanshu Chauhan uh, mentioned. Uh, that the basic principles of uh, risk assessment and communication seem to be very easy, uh, but uh, they are uh, really difficult to implement. So, uh, before COVID, uh, if we look at the context, before it actually hit us, nobody really heard about risk communication and so much about community engagement in terms of uh, emergency or uh, disaster risk uh, reduction. So, uh, when the vaccine was actually introduced, there was a lot of hesitancy and some of our uh, studies that were done by UNICEF showed that there was a huge absolute population that was not really ready to take the vaccine. So, what was important then? There was consistent, correct and transparent information because there was this huge information, fake news that was going around, there was social media, People were listening to different people, different, seeing different posts, which was creating this huge infodemic, uh, as it was uh, termed at that time. What was on the demand side? It was to build confidence of the community. We just heard two speakers in this session earlier, really to understand the community. What is it that they want? What is it that they want to understand? How can we raise awareness? How could we increase knowledge of those people? And local strategies. What would be the local strategy that we could understand the community and then address the myths and misconceptions? Some of the key barriers that was there for uh, vaccine uptake, of course, there was very low risk perception. There was very low awareness about the vaccine. There was poor knowledge of the dose of the scheduling. There was a lack of confidence in the efficacy, whether the vaccine will work, it will not work. There was fear of side effects, there will be long-term side effects, then there was low trust, there was huge misconceptions, there was um, uh, religious um, uh, misconceptions that the vaccine will um, uh, have long-term effects on men, women, children, etc. So what were the key strategies uh, that were uh, deployed uh, for uh, RCC? So basically, the RCC strategy is dependent on a lot of data that was coming from the community. It was also dependent on the converged efforts of ministries as well as the state departments down to the district and the GP level. A lot of efforts went into building the social capital. How are we building the leadership within the communities so that they could tackle this pandemic? The quality of evidence that was generated from ground really helped us to design these strategies. We developed communication strategies with the ministries. We harnessed all forms of media. Every form of media was used to raise this awareness and address the misconceptions and also built national alliances across. National alliances with different stakeholders like religious leaders, uh, private sector, development partners, etc. So what was the basic strategy? It was about how we planned together for this, how we built capacity, how this uh, capacity when implemented on ground, where the transfer of knowledge and information and messages actually took place, was it monitored, not monitored, and then course correction was done, and to sustain it, this needs to go on. So this is the key RCC strategy, and. Uh, uh, I don't think I really have time to uh, present all the best practices from different states. However, I just wanted to highlight that different platforms were used for mobilizing the community, be it the health frontline workers, or be it various mediums, uh, be it the uh, role models that we look at, uh, be it mass media, be it community radios, be it faith-based uh, organizations or leader, or the youth, so different community platforms were used to actually mobilize the community and spread the awareness about the vaccine as well as yeah. can. Yes, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, wrap up. So I'll, uh, uh, these are the various uh, tools and techniques that were used. A number of ILC materials were made, number of PSAs, etc. were uh, made. We've already heard about Kumbh Mela, how important it is. 
uh, to use these fair and festivals and also extremely important to actually engage with uh, religious leaders to address the misconceptions and the misinformation that is around. Also how to have targeted campaigns to reach the most marginalized. Uh, we worked uh, with the Ministry of Tribal Affairs and developed a strategy to ensure that the information of the vaccination really reached the remotest tribes and the remote and most vulnerable communities. Uh, we also uh, developed a serial which was on Doordarshan to actually sustain CAP practices. It's called mm -hmm. Namaste. It was a 26 episode uh, TV series. Uh, this is some of the data which basically uh, just shows how the RCC is uh, to influence and enhance uh, the CAP practices as well as uh, vaccination across the country. Some of the key lessons learned, I think the first one is most important and that is what we've been speaking since morning which is about preparedness. Communication is all always an afterthought. Probably what we should be doing is to make it a part when we are planning. So RCC should be an integral component of every plan that is uh, being developed. And I think uh, data for that would be very important. The other important point is also to feed it back to the community. What action has been taken, depending on their concerns and needs that comes from them, and the feedback loop should be completed. Just want to spend uh, two seconds on this slide, so on the resources that is available for uh, social and behavior change communication. We've just uh, developed a training module with NITM. It is on social and behavior change uh, communication. It has a 60-minute module for SBCC. Also 30-minute modules for specific uh, disasters like cyclones, earthquake, floods, and public health emergencies. These are some things that we developed with uh, the Ministry of uh, Panchayati Raj for the PRIs and also with Ministry of Health and Family Welfare on uh, the capacity building of frontline workers. Uh, I've also put the link of the IC material. Huge amount of IC material is available on the Ministry's website, so please do look at it. Thank you. Thank you. The last uh, speaker, Dr. Sora Gadalis. Thank you, Chair and Co-Chair. Uh, 18 June 1983, India versus Zimbabwe. The score was 17.45. Kapil Dev scored around 175 not out. The only issue was that match was not recorded. India went to lift the World Cup later on. The most important part in the match was not recorded. The BBC broadcasters were on strike. Everyone agrees at this point of time that India has done a very magnificent job in COVID-19 response. 25 years down the line, if somebody asks us, where is it? Have you documented it? And if our generation says the answer is no, then we should be ashamed. One such step in this direction where we have been able to do something at the lines where it marks a global level was the Great Ginnar experience. I am not going to, I am not a mountain trekker, hence I have not climbed Mount Ginnar, however I would like to. So there is a global terminology called interaction review, where we understand and uh, review the ongoing responses to emergencies and disasters. It has been uh, taken from a global concept called after action review, which is usually practiced uh, at a global level to concise the entire emergency and, and its response. Since the COVID-19 response was very long, uh, there was a methodical approach to develop an interaction review. So when the dynamics of the disease change or when the specific variant come in, this documentation becomes a key milestone for understanding what are the nuances of response. When you repeat response, you do not repeat the mistakes. And that was the core adaptation for it. So it was adopted, as I mentioned, from the after action review guidance. So why it was done? Because it has to be a participatory approach, open and honest review, and not an agency like WHO or some global agency coming and certifying the government that you are very good at response. So it has to be done by a third party assessment system but taking a comprehensive view, not from just policy makers or people who are involved in response, but from the top to the bottom approach. So interaction reviews are not an external evaluation 
and the phases in which it was carried out was an objective observation, analysis of gap, and key focus interview as well as identification of areas of improvement. The state was selected was the state of Gujarat. So, and the, there was a scientific standard, the WHO country office response strategy was based on the 11 pillars of response. So, hence this 11 pillars was taken as a benchmark on which the documentation is supposed to be done. Then there were some global tools and trainings that were available, so we uh, did a lot of training for the state and also developed the cadre of around 360 community medicine professors that could carry out the interaction review for future as well. Some of the key insights as you can see uh, in maintaining essential health services, risk communication and behavioral change, treatment and surveillance were very key for the states, including the very uh, prominent ones like the state implemented Danvantari for continuing health services since the very beginning. What were the key milestones? You know, it was there were a lot of assessors that were created by the WHO country office team through the trainings. The third party, like Indian Institute of Management, health is not just a health system job. So the Institute, Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, as well as the Indian Institute of Public Health, Gaminagar, and the State Health Resource Centers were roped in for doing this documentation at a very, very massive scale. 35 experts from various subjects were uh, deployed in the field to uh, interview an ASHA worker to a district collector, to the Principal Secretary of Health, Commissioner of Health, including the Deputy and the Chief Minister of State. All this during the 25 inter-team uh, consultation that were held between all the agencies and documented 11 strategic pillars of response. So it was a major initiative that went on for around three and a half months and resulted into a beautiful document. It is a WHO doc ideology called Interaction Review, which was translated and also a time to pay tribute to the state in its own form by giving it a name Girnar. We gave it a name Girnar called Gujarat Interim Review of Noteworthy Actions in Response to COVID-19. Girnar, if you are all aware, is the largest mountain of the state of Gujarat as well as the only place in the world where Asiatic Gir Lions reside. So this was one and all accepted by the Honorable Chief Minister of the state. And what makes it unique is that it's a unique response guide strengthening the existing health systems and prepare the systems to the outbreak. At this point of time when the documentation was being done, the vaccination has not yet started. And immediately three months later on the Omicron wave stuck. This was, the, this was the document the government, not just in Gujarat, but in other 18 states referred to for what they have been doing so far in the COVID response and what they can do better. So it was not a fault-finding exercise either, and it was not an exercise also to praise the government has been doing a very great work. But as in case of other examples like post-earthquake rehabilitation, Gujarat came up with one of the very best systems of build back better. Similarly, this even from the pandemic, the Gujarat Interaction Review is a, is a landmark on which the global documentations and other countries like Thailand and other Bangladesh has also taken peer cue from the Gujarat Interaction Review. The main task remains ahead of us is now to do an interaction review and an after action review for COVID-19 response for the entire country as well. So not just a documentation, but a series of 11 films uh, which are on YouTube available, as well as a policy brief for the policy makers was also prepared as a part of this particular documentation exercise. And it was published also in the peer review journals and is also available on the WHO Global website. So what I would like to say, and if we play well, it, the finishing also should be the best. Kapil Dev was a finisher on that particular day, probably in this 2020 session of the Marathon session that are going for in five minutes. I am the finisher today. We launched it at a very nice place along with the Chief Minister of Gujarat and it was covered usually by media. So what I need to say is, let us be prepared. After 20 years also, if somebody asks us, have we documented each and every disaster? Dr. Surya Prakash has taken lead in documenting most of the disasters in the country. Similarly, let us take a pledge that every disasters and emergencies now on will be documented and will be done in a grand way. Thank you.
Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the, all the speakers presented very well and on the important topics like home, case studies and best practices, India, and you know, in the, everything was done meticulously, even in one of the home mirror. And lastly, we had a bridge collapse that we had a number of emergencies. And I think our friend from India have mentioned about the need for uh, severe response. We have in country more than 2,000 major accident has had besides more than 50,000 industrial units, manufacturing chemical hazard equipment and uh, instrument uh, these chemicals. And uh, need for training was uh, mentioned almost by all uh, our speakers. And I must also mention about the DDRO, DRDO role. And they have uh, been working for the disaster and also played an important role during COVID, whether it was establishment of hospitals or development of kids. And the UNICEF has been always in the forefront for development of uh, risk communication material, whether it was Zika or even during the COVID. And uh, again, the, what was mentioned by agree with the Sorops uh, observation, we work in our country for various disasters. We respond well, but unfortunately, we don't document. So the need for documentation of responses and the best practices in the disasters is need of government. I thank all the speakers and uh, all the uh, participants for this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, on behalf of our organizing team, I'm very grateful to the respective panel of chair and co-chair mm -hmm. And the distinguished speakers from various organizations, particularly NDR of DRD, UNICEF, and WHO India and CDC India, for sharing their experiences and expertise in their relevant fields. Now I request uh, the ex school director, NIDM Sri Taj Hassan sir, to present a uh, great welcome to the Sri Ajit K. Sir, former cabinet secretary, government of India. other distinguished speakers on the board to get a group photo. Thank you once again.
delegates and join for the band session. Now it, now it, it's time to draw the contents for this National Conference on Public Health Emergency and Disaster Management organized by National Institute of Disaster Management in collaboration with NCDC, BHS, Minister of Health and Family Affairs and CDC India. So moving towards the validation of the National Conference, I take this privilege to welcome all the dignitaries for the validation. I request Executive Director Anadiyam Sridhar, Asanji and Dayas and Professor Suryan Prakash had UOC CDR and Dividend 2 on the dais and Mr. W. Chek to board on the dais and Dr. Himanshu Tohan, Joint Director of NCDC to board on the dais and Dr. Rajiv Sarma Dr. Rajiv Sarma emergency lead to be Sorry for the day, I'm waiting for the Dr. Rajesh Sharma. So, I request Dr. Rajiv Sharma to be on the dais. And I also humbly request Dr. Rajiv Sharma to summarize the national level conference on public health emergency disaster management. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sometimes you know it happens. Something goes well, something goes it's like something you know. It went well. Uh, it didn't went. Uh, it didn't go well. So all those things you know. Always we need to have improvement plan. So with that, uh, I will just summarize. As this is organized by uh, three distinguished uh, uh, institutions: National Institute of Disaster Management, NCTC, National Institute Center for Disease Control, and CDC India Country Office. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed deep flaws in the world's defenses against health emergency. The world was and remains unprepared for a large-scale health emergency. But this lesson is not a new one. For decades, the emergence of a new prone, pandemic-prone diseases, conflicts, disaster events, and other humanitarian crises or emergencies has caused global panic. An alarm partially due to unpreparedness in emergency prevention, response, and management. One thing that is clearly deliberated from today's discussion is interlinked priorities are key to standing national and global health system. We need to break the cycle of panic and neglected by enhancing capacity development, improving population health and make countries better prepared for more resilient against future health emergencies or pandemics. In a brief session, taking you from the first part, Dr. Meghna Desai, 
country director CDC India during her address rightly highlighted the effective governance is essential to bring greater equity, inclusivity and coherence to the public health emergency, preparedness response and resilience architecture, enabling key stakeholders to walk if collectively around the shared plan, galvanized by political will and with the resources to sustain positive changes. Dr. Anil Kumar, Exner, Director General of Health Services from Ministry of Health, Government of India, highlighted the role of NCDC and provided various referral services, technical support to individual patients, community, medical colleges, research institutions, and state health directorate. He also talked about technologies and surveillance system, which plays an integral, increasing and evolving role in supporting public health responses to outbreaks and other urgent public health threats and events. One of the most important issues that was highlighted by Sri Ajit K. Seth, former Cabinet Secretary, Government of India, and we are fortunate to have a highest policy maker part of this inaugural session. He highlighted, you know, investing in mental health, emotional health, well-being is imperative. Whether to enhance individual health and well-being, protection of human rights, improving economic efficiency, or moving towards universal health coverage. Followed by Lieutenant General Retired Sayyid Atta Hasnan, member NDMA, in his address very rightly pointed out that the risk of new public health emergencies and disasters continues to increase. Driven by escalating climate crisis, environmental degradation, and increasing geopolitical instability, disproportionately impacting the poor and most vulnerable. Our eco message that in an increasingly risky world, all the hazards need to be considered, not just individual threat, but also in relation to larger system that they are likely to interrupt or disrupt. Followed by Professor Dr. V. K. Paul, member of the IO, Government of India, drew the attention of gathering of India's effort to manage the pandemic and the best practices. He described a people-centric, whole of government, whole of society approach, built on past experiences of managing public health emergencies and as well as contemporary scientific knowledge. At the end, in his inaugural address, on the Minister of State for No Afia, Sri Ajay Kumar Misraji, said that public health emergencies and disaster do not respect national boundaries. Therefore, it is urgent to assess the impact of transboundary risk and simultaneously enhance our preparedness and response capability. He applauded the visionary leadership of Honorable Prime Minister and said his initiatives, policies, schemes and programs had given birth to the dawn of a new era. He highlighted Aatmanirbar Bharat Yogyan and said that Honorable Prime Minister has referred the journey from 2020 to 2047 as the Amrit Kal. This Amrit Kal is the period of attaining the resolution for Aatmanirbar Bharat. Then we have a technical session followed by inaugural session and the session one was emergency, public health emergency and disaster management. Uh, which was chaired by uh, Dr. Sigal, former DHHS, and co-chaired by uh, Sri Arun Sardev, USAID, and co-chaired by Kuti, Dr. Pradeep Kasnovis, uh, DDG, Disaster Medical and Ojapa. In the first speaker, Major General Professor Atul Kotwal, Executive Director and SSRC, gave a detail about the Indian Public Health Standards, IPHS, guidelines which act as the main driver for continuous improvement in quality, and serve as the benchmark for assessing the functional status of health facilities. The state and duties adopt these IPHS guidelines for strengthening public health care institutions and put in their best efforts to achieve high quality of health care across the country. As highlighted by him, there are certain key points that need to be focused as such. Comprehensive gap analysis, infrastructure, drugs, diagnostic equipment needs to be conducted. NHRC is also about to share a shelf 
assessment tool for gap assessment. That tool is uh, available uh, in public domain and the state may prioritize those uh, SCF which can achieve uh, uh, IPHS uh, compliance in a short term, mid term and long term plan. Major General Professor Atul Kothwal also underlined that to achieve IPHS compliance, the state may accord a cabinet decision to achieve the desired outcome by 2025-26 with necessary sanction of uh, human resource positions against IPHS 2022. Then another speaker from Ministry of Health, Dr. Naveen Varma, highlighted the public health procedures, policies in India, laws serve public health in at least two ways. First, law is itself a component of public health, infrastructure. Infrastructure public health laws include legislature, enactment that authorize the creation of government public health agencies and other statutes that endow them with the broad legal authority. Professor Suri Prakash said CBR and GMRD and IDM briefly discussed the National Disaster Management Act following the Public Health Act. The National Disaster Management Act policy plan, he mentioned that the Government of India, in recognition of importance of disaster management as a national policy, set up a high power committee, HPC, in August 1999, and a national committee after the Gujarat earthquake for making recommendations on for preparation of disaster management plans and suggesting effective mitigation mechanism. So he has given a, a, you know, a long historical uh, uh, prospect of how this disaster management uh, act and plan and institutions evolve. On 25 December 2005, Government of India enacted the Disaster Management Act, which envisaged the creation of National Disaster Management Authority headed by Honorable Prime Minister and the State Disaster Management Authority headed by respective chief ministers to, to spearhead the, and implement a holistic and integrated approach to disaster management in India. He also mentioned that NIDM has been also developed in the similar line based on the uh, acts and provision. Professor Zugal Kisor, Director uh, BMMC, Sardar Hospital, during his presentation, draw the attention of this gathering towards One Health. One Health approach were mentioned that One Health is an integrated unifying approach to balance and optimize the health of people, animal and environment. It is particularly important to prevent, predict, detect and respond to global health threats such as COVID-19 pandemic. The One Health approach mobilizes multiple sectors, disciplines, communities at varying levels of society to work together. This way, new better ideas are developed that address root causes and create long-term sustainable solutions. The second session was public health emergency and disaster management infrastructure and capacity building. So this session was chaired by Lieutenant General Sayyid Atam Hasnan, member NDMA, co-chaired by Dr. J. Kaka Krishnan, who is IAS Officer, Principal Secretary Governor of Tamil Nadu, and also co-chaired by Dr. Runa Hathi Gokde, Associate Director of Science Program, CDC India. Dr. Radha Krishnan also presented uh, in the session, uh, and he uh, highlighted the uh, government of Tamil Nadu COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, response, and importance of states to prepare for health emergencies and extended health system, including through intensified workforce development, enabling the existing work Post to quickly respond to the rapidly developing situation. He also highlighted the need to have effective, culturally acceptable, timely, relevant, understandable information and communication focused on change in behavior and not limiting it to creation of awareness only after a crisis has developed. The presentation was followed by Dr. Pradeep Kastovis, DDG Disaster Management Cell, underlined the setting of Health Emergency Operations Center, HEOC. Uh, at the national and sub-national level. I echo the message of Dr. Kastorovich that globally disasters are on the rise and more people are now vulnerable to exposure to multitude of hazards. He also discussed the proposed hybrid network for pandemic management and health program. Then followed by Mr. Chuck Manchion, who is from Global uh, Emergency Management Capacity Development Program from the CDC. He heads the program and works globally. He talked about the nation prepared, a federal perspective on preparedness and response shared United States experience. 
Those main objective is to provide a primer on national structure of US emergency response framework. He also enlightened about emergency management program, which is a single integrated program where emergency management principles, functions, and public health practices intersect. This emergency management program also focuses on prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery activities. Then at the last, Dr. Himanshu Chauhan, Joint Director, IDS Penchery, Seeing Government of India, has talked about Public and Emergency Response Center, PHERC, where he highlighted that during an emergency, it acts as a command center to manage disease outbreaks, public health emergencies, or disaster situations. And during peacetime, strengthening disease surveillance and response using data information technology, capacity building, and developing plan and policies. Dr. Himanshu highlighted point that need for prepared and response system to be extended before the event occur. This was the end of the session two. Then the last and the uh, technical session is uh, was uh, uh, session three, uh, public health emergency and disaster management, which is focused on best practices. And uh, this session was chaired by Sri Ajit K. Seth, Cabinet Secretary, former Cabinet Secretary, and co-chaired by Dr. Mujib Mohammed, former member of NDA. Uh, uh, CDC DHS team presented the best practices uh, uh, based on the uh, uh, 2021 experience, uh, community connect between Udham uh, Singh District of Uttarakhand and as well as the weekly webinar series. And, and later on, Sandi Prasad, uh, who is from uh, MISEF, uh, uh, SPC specifically highlighted <coughs> best practices in risk communication and community engagement. She explained community, uh, communicating risk effectively in emergencies by Engaging communities is a vital public health intervention. It can save lives during emergency situation and as such should be considered an investment in people's uh, health, safety and security. Sri Aditya Pratar Singh, Deputy Commandant uh, NDRF, presented a response to CBR and disaster uh, by NDRF and he has uh, also, uh, uh, you know, presented uh, uh, the strength and capacity and capabilities of NDRF uh, across the country. In the last presentation of the day, uh, Dr. Saurabh Dalal, who has presented uh, about the uh, interaction review of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, response of government of Gujarat, and that was also uh, you know, highlighted how important to uh, document the best practices. At the end, uh, Dr. Prabha Marda, scientist at DRDO, he has also presented uh, the CBR and uh, emergencies, how they evolve, what is the, uh, the importance of uh, preparedness, uh, building capacity in the peace time, and preparing ourselves for the uh, you know any event happen. So at the end, I would also like to uh, uh, say that you know unless we are prepared, uh, unless we are safe, no one is safe. So we live in a global village. Everyone is connected. We have been seeing, watching from the morning that you know. Uh, how um, frequently and how uh, soon or how, uh, you know, in an in interaction of, uh, I would say, hours, uh, uh, passengers can travel from one part to the other part, even one country to the other country. So preparedness is, uh, uh, you know, one of the important uh, uh, component of uh, uh, systems, so that this is uh, this conference is, uh, uh, you know, in the similar direction. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Suzar, uh, for summarizing that whole day conference into a few sentences. Uh, now I request Dr. Himanshu Chauhan, Joint Director NDSP, IDSP, MCDC, to share a few words in the valid session. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, for, of which I'm also a part uh, of that organizing team, uh, that uh, a timely uh, recognition of the issue and uh, acting upon it uh, in the form of this conference uh, uh, has been organized. Uh, we we often uh, forget that there's a very thin line between uh, disasters and public health emergencies uh, with one uh, closely attached uh, with the other. Uh, whenever there's a public health emergency, there are higher chances of a disaster happening. Uh, but whenever there is a disaster, a public health emergency may already have taken place uh, if not recognized. Uh, so these, these two systems, uh, 
which uh, are well developed in their own uh, fields, which have systems of their own. Uh, it, uh, it is a culmination of the past uh, six months or more than that, the efforts that we have been having together, uh, that these two systems are together uh, on, on the same platform uh, and are uh, talking to each other, interacting with each other, growing with each other. Uh. So uh, this, this is uh, a, a very uh, nice initiative uh, and it has uh, started not just at the top level. Uh, from the village level onwards, there was an example of uh, a village level intervention in uh, Khatima block. Uh, and up to the highest level today, we have seen uh, policy makers uh, from, from the highest offices uh, talking about this uh, close uh, link between disaster management and public health emergency management. Uh, so I think we have come a full circle uh, starting uh, from the village uh, and uh, linking it up at the highest levels. Uh, the need now is uh, to carry this momentum uh, further and uh, see that uh, similar programs, similar uh, interventions uh, starting from the village level uh, up uh, to all the policy level uh, officials uh, need to be conducted uh, in other states as well. And we have a, a curriculum uh, design which the, the uh, course material was also released today. And uh, uh, there are a couple other uh, levels for which uh, the curricula are being finalized. Uh, so once that is uh, in place, uh, then NIDM uh, as well as uh, NCDC can uh, work closer uh, and uh, see that it is rolled out uh, in other states in the form of an organized uh, structured program. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to thank uh, each and every one of you taking out time uh, and contributing to these deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your insightful words uh, to way forward for public health emergency and disaster management. Now I request Mr. Tavichak Mention, Lead Global Capacity Building, uh, USCDC, to share a few words. Welcome, sir. <laughs> okay. I will guarantee you that I will be brief. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, uh, thank um, all involved in setting this up and the uh, structure was absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, the things that I observed today uh, that I will share with you briefly is that uh, in your organizations, you have a lot of experience, uh, learning, and opportunities all at the same. But um, in times past, when we worked in a more of a vertical and ever integrated system, today, in the times that we live in, it's gonna be very important to learn that we are as learning institutions and as learning organizations to be more integrated, nimble, or as I like to describe it, a nerve-centered network. There is a lot on my left in an organization and a lot on my right whereby we can bring together and combine a lot of that to achieve a lot more. So we realize that together we achieve a lot more, but it's gonna be important um, that as we move forward, we look, take advantage of the opportunities and practice the discipline of living uh, by uh, a, a matrix and not afraid to try new and novel concepts. So as, as we grow and learn, being nimble, that we're grateful for the past. It has served us well. What can we do new and different today? And how can we add to the, uh, another dimension to look at things from a number of different perspectives? So I think that is important. Um, I believe with the uh, established leadership you have, you are well on your way. Uh, India is number one in a number of different uh, venues and, and perspective, and this is no less different. Uh, and with that, I really want to say I thank you for inviting us here, and on behalf of CDC, um, my center director, Dr. Uh, Michelle Ralinsky, and the uh, India CDC director, Dr. Megna Desai, I am grateful for the opportunity, and I look forward to serving with you in, f in future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your valuable words. Now I request Professor Shuru Prakash at EOC, CBR, and GMRT to share a few words in their valid session. I know it's a day-long session. Uh, throughout day, you're listening to many. It's very difficult. But I'll just say two, three things. One, that whatever we have learned, we need to practice. Only then we will have the benefits of it. 
So kindly take the key inputs that you have got from this national conference and bring them into your practice and implementation. The second is that uh, we are actually compiled by our attitudes. We need to change those attitudes. We wish to be more reactive and uh, response oriented than proactive and prepared. So I would say, kisi shahar ne kaha na, nazar badlo, nazare badal jayenge, soch badlo, sitare badal jayenge, kashtiyo ko badal ne ki jurt ni yaro, disha badlo ke nare badal jayenge. So kindly try to be, move in the direction of risk to resilience, rather than reaction to response. Okay, that's my suggestion. And uh, lastly, I would say, that uh, whatever is required, we are always with you. We are trying to enhance the capacities of our human resources with all our endeavors as per our mandate from the Disaster Management Act, as I said in the beginning today, and we will continue to do so. We are sailing in the same boats. We have to work as a team. As somebody has said, team means together each achieve more. We cannot achieve more without working in uh, No. Uh, integration and mainstreaming DRR with our activities. So that's what is in a part, but this conference should not be considered as a single episodic event. This has to continue and sustain, as Vivekananji has said, arise away and stop not till the goal is achieved. And our goal, as I told you in the beginning, of the national policy is zero casualty, disaster free, and transnational. With these words, I thank you all for the cooperation and support throughout the day. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your valuable words. Now I request Honorable Expert Director and I Sri Padakasan, sir, to deliver a few words in the valuable session. I wish you the guys, ladies and gentlemen. Now it is the concluding, conclusive time of this whole day conference. It's my pleasure to be here. In the morning, I could not come because I had some urgent uh, departmental promotion committee meeting in which the other members were who came from outside the So I could not participate. Uh, you have gone through the whole day's procedure and I have come to know what all has happened. Uh, emergency, we talk about public health emergency. It means itself that there is an emergency. And it also means that there will not be SOP, preparedness, and things like that in a systematic manner we work. Uh, I was, that time uh, when there was a first lockdown in 2020 March, I was working with Delhi Police as head of the traffic in charge. And suddenly, we realized that the whole city has stopped. And that time, then we started, there was no SOP, no readiness, no, you know, nobody knew that situation uh, can become like this. So, we came to realize that the cargoes had to be a lot to the city. You know, the food and things like that, whereas initially there was a total lockdown. So, immediately we opened a control room. We printed the pass, whole line we printed the pass. By morning we were ready with the pass, so we will give to the truck owners. And the food has to come. And then by morning we were ready that the, at the entry gate of Delhi, the trucks carrying food and vegetable and essential items and you know, medicine, they can enter the city. This was the emergency handling. Then situation was assessed that you deploy a lot of people to manage this situation, but there is no food available for them. The hotels were closed, there was nothing to eat. The roads were deserted. So in that situation, how do you manage? And a lot of people were leaving the city. And in that condition, we were standing on the road knowing fully well that there can be infection. And uh, somehow had to manage, get the buses, coordination with the various authority, announcing them that you stay here, there is no problem, and even providing food for them. So this is the epidemic. This is the first time a typical kind of emergency we had faced. And now, after so many years of, you know, then the system came up, various committees were formed, various response mechanisms were established, and things were fine-tuned, then the area were identified, 
you know, uh, the marking and uh, no entry zone and then uh, COVID patients, density increase, then you can't go there. Those segregation systems were insured or not. These, this I'm saying as a somebody who was a practitioner, not as somebody who documented this, who, you know, uh, made all these records of the events. But I am very happy that the three organizations, NIDM, Mr. Surya Prakash, my professor is here, then NCDC of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and the United States CDC, Country Office India, they contributed together, they worked on, the, uh, on these issues. They collated everything, and now we can say we have a SOP, we have a manual, we have a way to communicate with the people. We documented a lot of things for the awareness and for proper response. Ministry of Home Affairs played a very important role. The, you know the National Disaster Management Act, all policy guidelines to the uh, State Disaster Management Authority and the response mechanism on the COVID was to be issued by Ministry of Home Affairs, which issued time to time, which is allowed, which is not allowed, you know, allowed in a sense, uh, allowed in the area, the lockdown measures and easing of the long measure, uh, lockdown measures gradually. It was a lot of learning lesson, a lot of curve. And with this experience and with this whole study program, we generated a lot of information in the experience, which have been deliberated upon here in this conference. And now the challenges and opportunities properly documented. I am hopeful that as other speakers were saying, we should take it forward for practical practices. So that now we have a plethora of information, we can use it in a proper way. Whenever such crisis comes, God forbid such crisis comes, but still the whole system and machinery should be ready to face it properly. This COVID was a very uh, a strange kind of uh, challenge, otherwise we get sometimes big accidents, other human made uh, disasters in which also the public health emergency is called for and in that situation also we should be ready to respond in a proper way and all, all this documentation certainly would help everyone, uh, everyone of us, the, uh, the academia who studies these issues, the, uh, document, uh, the experts and those practitioners, ultimately we are mean for practitioners. It should go down to the line who on the ground stands and ensures these things. I am very happy that the conference has deliberated upon the public health emergency and disaster management. That also include chemical and biological emergency as well, challenges we face. And way to advance what is our next line of action. And I would like to express my appreciation and gratitude to the speakers and delegates and those who participated in this and contributed here. And I also thank my Iridium team and the partner institution for this timely initiative. Thank you. Jai Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now I request Professor Sunil Prakash to present a moment to the Executive Director and Idea of Sri Dada Sir. Now I request Dr. Raju Sir Master to present a plan to the Executive Director and Idea.
dignitaries, speakers, delegates, and the participants for accompanying us for the day-long deliberations on public health emergency and disaster management. And now we have the time to say it is concluded, but doesn't mean it's ended. It's only two days uh, deliberation concluded, but with the way forward, and we have to move on the roads ahead and continue this journey to achieve our goals. Right? So with these words, I thank you one and all, and uh, let's uh, meet each other again at the tea after this. Thank you one and all.